for the presentation. Right, and I see Rich is now joining us. Oh, yeah, Rich has been here. Okay. And you should be getting the attendees and, now. Got, I'll just let them in. Yeah, okay. So do you want to start um, elevating our attendees? Yep. We may as well while we're waiting. And I'll tell you, and you have the list, Rich. I do, yep. I have it right Yeah, here. so yeah. whoever we've got, let's see, we've got Jimmy, which I bet is uh, Jimmy Anthony, and mm -hmm. George Zinu. And let's see who else uh, we have. Um, I don't know who Graham Bershaw is, but let Melissa Farley. Yep. And uh, uh, Robert Bufamente. Monte, pardon me, Robert, he's a Monte, right? And um, let's see who else we have. Robert Bufamonte. So far, I think those are it. Oh, Luke De Palma. Also, you see him, Rich? Yep, I got, um, yep, got him right there, yep. Okay, so far that seems to be the people. Uh, the DEP folks may come a little later because they will be presenting a little That's later. Right. Um, Melissa, let me ask you, are the folks from MTA New York City Transit here uh, who will be doing the first presentation, the Grand Canal Courts? Can you tell me, Melissa? Well, um, I just... Um... And just Melissa should be promoting. Yeah. Oh, she she's not there. Yeah. Yet. Nope. She just hasn't come through yet. Yeah. And there's somebody named Sanji Patel. Uh, unless you are one of the presenters, Sanji, we do not ask questions yeah. until later. No, no. Sanji is on the uh, list from MTA. Oh, is he on? Okay, yeah. great. And please elevate him. Sorry, yeah. Sanji. Apologies. Yeah. Do look at that list. Yeah. Okay, okay, so do we have um, <coughs> Melissa? Yeah, yeah, I'm coming. Here I am. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Melissa, I just need to ask you, who are the folks who are first? Are they here? Yeah, so it, 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 okay, yes, so. Okay, that's where we can start. Yes. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Okay, then. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Community Board 2, Manhattan's Traffic and Transportation Committee and Parks and Waterfront Committee joint meeting. And um, I will introduce you to the members of the Transportation Committee, and then Rich will, uh, I'll introduce Rich too, and then he will introduce you to the members of the Parks Committee. So uh, I'll do this by way of calling attendance and start with uh, Natasha Avanasians. Here. Can, you're there and can you identify so people can take a look and see you, okay. Yes, hi, Natasha Avanasians, a member of Community Board 2 and a member of the Traffic and Transportation Committee. We see you and thank you. Okay, and next is, uh, my eyes are going to be, okay. <laughs> oh. Uh, Amy Brenner is not here. Janet Liff, I know, is here. Janet, can you just call out so everybody can see you? Janet, I know mute, she's I here. I saw her before. I did. I'm sorry. Hello. Hello. Hi there, Janet. Okay. okay. And um, Dan Miller. Can hey you there. I'm a uh, member of both committees tonight, Parks and Waterfront okay. and Traffic okay. and Transportation. Yeah, so DM and um, Let's see who else we have. Oh, Lois. I know I saw Lois. Lois Rackoff. Hello. Hello. Can you see me? You saw Lois, I see you. Yes, I do. And Hi, everybody. I am a full board member for traffic and transportation. Okay. For CB2. We have Anthony Wong. And I know I saw you, Anthony. Can you yep, just identify uh, yourself? There yep. you are behind your newest graphic, Anthony Wong. And then Adam Zeldin, I know I saw you too, Adam. Adam, can you just- Hi, this is Adam, Adam. I'm here. I'm a member oh. of the Traffic and Transportation Oh, you gotta Committee. show your face, Adam. Can we oh, see my, you? I'm having some camera issue. I think you can hear my audio oh, now. Okay, <laughs> right. And then we have our, our two public members, 
and I know they are here. Uh, Joseph Slayhaven, Joseph. I'm here. Identify yourself, okay. <clears throat> Joseph is on phone, I think, so he can't be seen. And then uh, George Hycalis, I know you're here too. George, yes, can you I'm here. call? I'm okay, here. There you are. Okay. Okay, so Rich. Yes. I, I would like to introduce Rich Cacapolo. Thank, who thank is you. The chair of the Parks and Waterfront Committee, and he'll introduce his members. Well, thank you. Well, I obviously I have to start with Shirley, who is also a member. Oh, that's of right. Parks and Waterfront. Yes. yes. <laughs> as There's is a lot uh, of duplication tonight. As is Dan uh, Miller, uh, who's introduced himself already. Next up, I see uh, on the list here. I see Frederica. Please introduce yourself. That's who I am. And she's a uh, member of our committee. Um, I see Chris is on. Hi, uh, Chris Tignes, Parks Waterfront member and member of the community board. Now, I, I see Elizabeth. Um, I think you may be on. Uh, I'm here. Phone. Yep, I'm here. And, and Sharon, uh, you may be on phone, too, I can't, I, I think. Yes, um, I'm Sharon Willems. I'm a public member, Parks Committee. Thank you. And, and Coral, I see uh, your uh, photo there. Sorry, here I am. I'm here. Thank you for, for joining. I know Susanna uh, asked to be um, absent. She's uh, on a trip. I think that's everybody else. I'll, I'll call out anybody who's late, um, who has uh, yet to join. Um, and uh, if you look in there, there are other community board members who are not on our committees, but um, have uh, taken some time from their busy lives. So I, I see a bunch of people like Valerie and Carter and and oh, uh, as well. So yeah, thanks for joining, guys. Um, I see Michael Levine's here too. I promoted him. So um, we have a good turnout. So we got. Uh, we have. Uh, so I'll turn it back to you. Okie dokie. So um, I'll just give a short overview of our procedure. And then we'll move right into the presentations because we have several tonight. So uh, basically, for you, those of you who don't know, to start with, we have obviously the raise hand symbol at the uh, bottom of the screen. And um, that's what you will use if you would like to speak. And the way we do it is we have we have three items on our agenda, but we actually have the second item divided into four items. So basically, there's actually going to be six presentations. And after each of the presentations, there will be questions and comments. First, the committees mm -hmm. will go with their questions. Uh, they will not do comments because they're going to do that in business session. And then we will open it up to the floor in each case after each of these six items uh, so that our guests can both comment and ask questions as well. And uh, just to tell you what comes after that, uh, we, we go into business session. And in business session, we discuss what just happened and whether we will do resolutions on them and what our comments will be, and we take votes. Not the end, then goes to full board, which is on uh, Thursday, no, month. let's see, what do I have here? Full board is on the 23rd, Thursday the 23rd. So there's that's where the full board votes on whatever these issues are that we have done resolutions on. And that would be the final decision. And everybody is welcome to attend that. By the way, you're welcome to attend our business session, but you are asked not to speak. You can just observe at that time. Uh, any guidelines? Uh, I'm just trying to think. Oh, yeah, a, a big one. Um, we probably will be having a lot of people speaking tonight. We have a big, long agenda. And so your comments, guests need to be kept to no more than two minutes. Adam will be timing you on that. And uh, so think in advance exactly what you wanna ask and what you wanna say, because we really need to limit that time. And I think that's about, does anybody else have anything else to say about our guidelines, what we might 
Rich. Yeah, just uh, it's been surely it's been posted for the last few minutes, so everybody has an opportunity to read it, and I think uh, we're ready. Great. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, and there is a meeting protocol, and it will also be on the chat as well. So, without Very further good. ado, we have MTA New York City Transit for the first presentation. Actually, for several after that too, and that is going to be on a substation construction project underneath the Grand Canal Courts, if you're familiar with them. They're located at the intersection of Thompson Street, Canal Street, and Sixth Avenue. And who will be presenting on that? Uh, it will be me, Shirley, and then my oh, colleagues okay. will- Thanks, Melissa. Move the, and our project team will be able to answer uh, any questions when we, after the presentation. Right, so, I, I'll call on you, you know, ask you okay. mm -hmm. Rift will, will call on um, any of our guests. Okay. okay, so I'm going to share my screen, so just bear with me. Okay. Yep, Do we see it. That's great. Oh, Coming up. Okay. Great. Oh, yeah, we see it. We see it, Melissa. Okay, hold on. I just want to get it so that I can. Okay, how is that? That's great. Okay, so thank you, everybody, for having us tonight to present on this important project for the new uh, substation. It's in support of the AC&E service that runs along 8th Avenue. And just an overview, an agenda overview for the presentation, we'll go over the project, um, the current construction status, work hours, project milestones, and construction, uh, construction look ahead schedule. And then we'll take any questions and comments as directed by um, the chairs of the committees. So for the project overview, this is a subsurface power station that we're building for the 8th Avenue AC and E line. And it's going to provide dependable and redundant power for the existing system serving the AC and E subway lines, while also supporting our upgrade to a new train control system, which will be which will bring a better, more frequent and more reliable service. And it's also going to increase the power capacity by five trains per hour from 23 to 30, I'm sorry, from 28 to 33 trains per hour to support future ridership in conjunction with communications-based train control, which is the acronym you might see often in um, some of our mailings, which was CBTC uh, signal system. So the date of the award of the contract was in September 7, 2022. And the contractor is EE Cruise and Company. The contract cost was $53,161,630. It's uh, completely funded by the MTA and the project duration is 36 months. Okay. So what is a, a substation? Uh, it's a traction power substation converts the AC electric power from Con Edison to the DC voltage required to supply the subway trains with enough power to function. Uh, New York City Transit has approximately 275 substations throughout all five boroughs, and the substations are either below grade, beneath the street, or in at-grade buildings. And substations are in a wide variety of neighborhoods, including residential, commercial, and industrial. And some of the locations in Manhattan that we've highlighted to show the various locations are, um, you'll see here West 99th Street, at Central Park West is below grade. And East 57th Street between 3rd and Lexington Avenues is in a building with, uh, at street level. Uh, Greenwich Avenue and West 13th Street is also an at grade building. And then at West 13th Street and 6th Avenue is below grade substation. So this is just a, a, a map and a, and a photo just to show you the area. I'm sure everybody on the meeting is familiar with it. So as, as Shirley mentioned, it's at the, inter the courts are at the intersection of 6th Avenue, Thompson Street, between Canal and Grant Street. And this is a, just a photo of what the courts looked like before we took possession of it. And this is what we have for the maintenance and protection of traffic um, that we work on with New York City DOT. So the red outlined area is the, the work site, which we have closed. And then this area here is where we will be doing um, utility relocation work on Thompson Street. So the current work status. So the main work zone is now captured within the concrete barriers and fence until September, 2024. 
Um, we had a pre-construction survey of the three adjacent buildings completed and all monitoring devices have been installed on the buildings. The trees and the basketball court have been removed. The guidewall construction for the supportive excavation installation has begun, which includes a small concrete course. Uh, the drill rig for the pile work has been mobilized and built, and the secant pile installation has begun on the northeast corner. So here are some photos of what's happening at the site right now. You can see this, uh, this is what it looks like right now with the um, barricade, the Jersey barrier and the barricades around the site. These are some of the forms that they're putting in for the guide wall installation. And this is the rig that's being used um, to put in the secant piles that will form out the room so that we can excavate at the site. So for permitted hours and days of work, um, it's weekdays, um, Monday through Friday, 7 to 9 p.m. Um, the contractor plans to keep above ground work to between 7 a.m. and 3.30 p.m. However, there will be some days where it may go to 5 p.m. or later as needed, depending on what the work is. For instance, if we're getting a concrete delivery, we need to pour right away. We can't let that sit and that kind of thing. Weekends, um, allowable work hours are 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Saturdays. Currently, there's no above ground work planned um, for Saturdays and Sundays. And then Sundays hours are 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, for this project, we have monitoring um, for vibration and noise. So EE Cruz is providing and install is, is provided, installed and, main, and is maintaining vibration sensors to monitor vibration levels at adjacent buildings as well as the subway tunnel during construction. The vibration sensors are installed on the exterior of the three adjacent properties of the Soho Grand Hotel, the Modern House Hotel, and the BINY karaoke bar. Um, EE Cruise is also monitoring the sound levels, and the sensor is installed on the exterior second floor parapet of the South, oh, I'm sorry, the Soho Grand Hotel. Um, prior to any construction activities, a baseline of ambient levels will be recorded. And here is a chart of the project schedule milestones. Um, so as I mentioned, the contract was awarded in September of 2022. Um, we started the street utilities on Thompson Street, this month, and that will that work will go through to September of this year, 2023. The communication integration from Greenwich Street also started um, in February, and that will go through till next August, 2024. The Grand Canal Court restoration is scheduled to happen September, 2024. That's when we people will be able to use the court again, and then the underground substation work um, will be completed in August of 2025, which uh, with the final closeout of the project in November of 2025. Uh, so upcoming work for the next 30 days um, in the main work zone, we're continuing to dig and pour the guide wall. We're continuing drilling and installing the sea camp piles on three sides of the site, excluding the Thompson Street um, that will wait until the street utility locations are complete. And there are also steel and concrete deliveries ongoing onto the site. Uh, for Thompson Street, we're setting up the MCT, the Maintenance and Protection of Traffic, um, as directed by New York City DOT, and we're moving traffic. They'll be open. Um, traffic will be able through traffic will be able to go through onto Thompson Street, and there'll also be water and gas, electric and sewer util street utility relocations within Thompson Street. There. There may be some time, I'll just add that um, we may have to intermittently close Thompson Street if we have a delivery of, or something's happening, but the goal is that we'll keep Thompson Street open to through traffic. And so the pro for the project schedule, the six week look ahead, um, we have our utility con subcontractor is mobilizing on the site starting today. Um, we have some test pits on Thompson Street and um, saw cutting of the asphalt, up, which will be a one week duration. We have to drill and pour the secants, um, which is ongoing. The trench for the common trench for the street utilities will be a four week duration um, to receive and inspect the 20 inch water main materials. Also in this time, we'll be installing the 20 main of the 20 inch water main pipe uh, and also installing the new electric ducts as well as a new gas line. 
And for contacts for the project um, is myself um, so for government and community relations for New York City Transit, my colleague Joe O'Donnell from MTA Construction and Development, who is the MTA agency that oversees the construction projects, couldn't join us tonight, but he's also a contact that's available um, to, to be reached out to. And then my colleague Luke De Palma is also a contact for New York City Transit. And we also have a project hotline um, that people can call, I believe, um, I may, in the Q&A, the team can reference that, but I believe that that's during working hours, that's the project hotline that can be used. And yeah, yes, thank you. And we will take any questions as- Melissa, yeah. I wanna also so, add- um, Oh, sure, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanna add one thing about the restoration of the park after we're done. So part of our, re our agreement with parks is to install six new tree pits that'll be bigger and wider than the existing ones. Um, and new pavers and new park benches, water fountain, and basketball hoops. So all that's included when we restore the park. Okay. So uh, first, thank you. And um, first, we will go to committee members. And I see Fred Rieger has her hand up. Thank you so much. Uh, did I see that the work is Monday day only? Say that, that it's, say that again. The work is, the work is taking place from Monday to Friday. Right now, there's, it's work is Monday to Friday. Okay, yeah. so that doesn't mean that once the work is, is, is underway that the, the space will be available to the community on the weekends, right? No, the, won't the be, no. right. No. Okay, so given this unfortunate and long-term impact of the project on our very limited open space. Is there any uh, schedule, is the schedule optimized to minimize the downtime during the project, as opposed to scheduling a project in an area that doesn't deprive a community of an open space? Jimmy, okay. do you want to yeah. talk to is that, that at Is all? that not clear? No, it is. You you want to make sure we're optimizing our use of time since we're occupying this parkway. Yeah, I mean it's a long period of time, and you know if there were a way of compressing the schedule so that it was it limited the the downtime on the space, that would be that would be great. Jimmy, this is design build, correct? Yeah. This, so this is a design build contract. So the the schedule was also part of the bid. So the, the, the contractors were given incentives to bid the shortest duration possible to finish all the above ground work. Uh, and that's how E Cruise won, uh, won this contract. So this is the best possible time we got from the contractor. So it, what he's saying is we're not just factoring in the cost, but also the impact duration of the occupying the space for the construction. And I just want to also point out that we'll be returning the park to public use before the project's done. As soon as we can excavate and build everything, we'll restore the, the um, surface level and continue for about another year finishing up the contract. So can you just explain out. to us the, the downtime on the space as opposed to the construction schedule? Can you rephrase that, the downtime on space? Yes, in other words, it's a, construct, a construction schedule of a certain number of years, but that's not going to necessarily be offline for the space. The park, yeah, right. So it's about a 36 month, I think we said, duration yeah. for the full construction, yes. but the park is not out of service for that whole time. So it's going to be reopened. It's about a year of the park being closed to the public. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. We closed okay. it in, I think, September or August. And we plan to reopen it in September of next. Okay, great. Okay. Or two years, rather. Two years. Yeah. Two years. Two years. It, it, September when do you plan to open? September. So we 2024. Closed it, we closed oh. it last year, and it'll be closed for two years. Okay. Uh, Natasha. Hi, thank you guys for joining tonight. Um, I know you mentioned that there'll probably be minimal amount of um, street level activity on Thompson Street, but I, I do know there are a lot of a number of restaurants um, along that corridor and just wanted to 
see if you guys have reached out to those businesses just to, to keep them posted and that there's proper signage. On on Thompson Street between so we North of Canal. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So there's there's we went to everybody around around the corners, but if there was somebody further down on Thompson, you can let us know. But we would have we have to put the signage out for New York City DOT that's going to mention, you know, that that we're working on the street and showing that the, the lane of traffic is shifted in that way. And we've also been in touch with the we're in touch with the hotels for any deliveries, that kind of thing. So great, thank you. Okay. Okay, then Lois. Yes. Hello. I noticed that you uh, mentioned uh, about the basketball court. Which basketball court are you talking about? And what inconvenience will be for the court, the playground, and the players? So it's the it's the basketball court that's at, if I can go back, I'll show you. It's the, the court that's on the intersection of Avenue of the Americas. Which is Thompson Street and Sixth Avenue. Yeah, an aerial view. There's yeah. an aerial view of that. And right here. So that's the court that's closed. We closed it, as um, my colleague Luke said, in August of last year. Um, we had to have um, parkland alienation in order to do that. So that's when we took possession of the court. And it'll be closed, as we just mentioned, until September of 2024. Um, we had not had um, any... Any out, um, anybody reach out to us about mm -hmm. leagues that use the court or that kind of thing. So if anybody has um, has heard that, you know, certainly let us know, and then we would work with parks to with you know where they could where they would be able to use another court during that time that the that the park is closed. Now, is it? This is uh, of course underground work uh, infrastructure. Are you in? Are you doing anything to the surface of those basketball courts eventually? Yes, it will be. It, it will be restored. It, the, that will be all restored or restored. Yes, it will it'll, it'll be restored to basketball courts. And as Luke mentioned, with uh, the new trees, we have. New, they'll be putting new trees in. Parks has some other um, plans for benches, that kind of thing. We're working with parks with that, but it will be restored to be a basketball court again. That the community will be able to use. Okay, thank you. Okay, Dan. Oh, uh, thanks. I have just a quick question as a follow up from Frederica. Are there any financial penalties to the contractor if they don't finish on time? Oh, good question. Yeah, that that is true. <clears throat> they they have uh, they would have to pay liquidated damages for every single day they go beyond uh, um, the set the date we have for completion. Okay, thank you. And uh, Carl. Carl? I'll give me just a second, thank you. Um, so yes, the, I have a eighth grader who does play at that court quite often with his friends. It's a great space for middle school kids. So seven, six, seventh, and eighth um, particularly use that court because it's just not as dominated by the bigger boys um, on the Hudson River Park or West Forth. And now Vesuvio is also having to share a lot with pickleball, so that's only one hoop. So what, what I wanted to suggest is a, as a mitigation step that might be um, inexpensive and sort of handle this two year gap is just literally putting like a couple hoops, like those portable hoops on the opposite side of the street in the sort of open space that was that Jatan space. Oh, where you know what, you're asking questions, we're not talking. Yeah, so, so what- ask what them would, if they have plans for that. Yeah, it would be, what are you doing to make sure that we actually have basketball courts that can be used over that two year period in the nearby area? So we haven't, well, in our coordination with parks, we didn't um, seek, proactively seek an alternative location to have basketball go on. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a good suggestion that we can flag for parks and see what their thought is. I think it's if easy, could, so yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I mean- I, If you I'm need any more ahead. feedback, I'm happy to give it. Yeah, I'm looking at um, just Google Street View. I see there's like some triangles of open space. Is this directly west? Yes. Where there's like city bike stand, there's like 
Yeah, and it's just like open and there's nothing there. And there's a, yeah. there's a street that's closed. So it's like kind of perfect. You just go, uh, yeah. So okay. see, I'm see maps, and apart, you can just so. put, yeah, you can just put two at each end and that's it. I mean, that would be awesome. Yeah, let me let me take it by parts. It's not something that we would install and supervise ourselves, but I am happy to bring that up with parks. See what they suggest. Thank okay. You. Mm -hmm. Did we lose Shirley? I think we, uh, I can't see her on here. Why don't we, um, why don't we go to Michael? Okay, thank you for the um, uh, excellent presentation. I have a technical question. You mentioned pouring the secant. Can you explain what that means? And is that part of the plan or is that in addition to the work that will be done? And what is secant? Jimmy, you want, Robert, to, take that? You want to address that question? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so secant piles are basically, um, this is about a 60 foot deep excavation in order to build this structure underground. So before we start digging, um, basically a 60 foot box or hole, um, we use a drill rig like you saw in the picture and uh, we drill down a three foot diameter um, casing pipe. And once that's all the way in the ground down to bedrock, we take concrete and steel and we fill that three foot casing pipe with concrete and steel. And then you pull the pipe out, which basically just acts as a form. And then you overlap all those three foot um, diameter um, piles and you overlap them all around the site. And you essentially have hopefully a somewhat waterproof and structural uh, wall all around. And then you could dig out everything inside of that. So it's a sea camp pile wall on four sides, and then you could dig down all in the middle of that um, in order to do our underground work. And all of this work is included in your work program, right? In the same time frame. Correct. Well, thank you. That's a very interesting explanation. Thank you. Um, I think I'll just go, because I don't know it's in my hand here. Um, yeah, I have I have, I have a, you mentioned um, you're going to plant six new trees. Are you going to preserve the existing street trees and then add six new trees? Are you planning on chopping all those trees down and then just replacing them? Robert, I think uh, you should address that. Yeah. Sure. Um, unfortunately, the existing trees were um, directly in conflict with the deep excavation, the 60 foot deep excavation. So um, there was not an option to protect or maintain them. Um, so we went through uh, New York City uh, Parks and Forestry Division in order to get permission um, to cut them down. They have been removed and uh, the new tree pits are bigger, um, I dare say nicer with nice new street pavers than the original and restitution was paid to the forestry division um, so they will handle installing uh, the new trees. Uh, yeah, in in the pre-read, I'm, I'm sorry, John, you may not have seen it, but in the pre-read, oh, they explained that um, as of December 28th, they started the removal of the six trees uh, in order to accommodate the construction activities. As, again, I think everyone should know this is a, a status update. This isn't a, this isn't a, uh, we're about to launch a project. This is a, a status update. The project's been going on for, for a while. Um, okay, thank you. Place, Paul, again. do you have another question? Or you just have your hand there? No, no, sorry, I didn't lower it. Oh, okay. Does anybody else have questions? Because I have a couple. Yeah, you should go, sure. Oh, okay. Uh, first of all, Luke uh, De Palma, I just wanted the details on those improvements that you're putting back. You said you were actually extending the park, right? No, um, not no. extending the park. No. But the um, so I, I talked about the with our MOU with parks, we have we'll be installing wider, longer tree pits. 
So if you look at the photo that we have up, you can see how small those street beds are. Right. So why, why no longer what? We'll be ex expanding the tree pit size. To better oh, water along a tree pit. Okay. And Not then a new far. water fountain, new bench. Another water fountain. Anything else? Basketball hoops. So the park oh, is the corner park. Will be new small. basketball hoops. The same number, right? Yeah. Yeah. New basketball hoops. Uh, anything else? That's it. It's um, oh, okay. updating, upgrading the existing court. Right. And Perfect. it'll be the same amount of six trees that you're putting back, right? Or are you adding trees? I believe we're just replacing. Um, okay, replacing the trees. One for one. And one, any, yeah, one for one. anything else? I mean, in terms of landscaping, I guess not. You didn't mention it. But I mean, this is this is primarily just a large basketball court. Right. So, we know. Yeah. But so there's always the hope. <laughs> we don't want to landscape it or do anything that changes the program that Parks already has for it. Okay. So I think that was my questions. It was about the trees and, and, the, and the improvements. And so the improvements would be in bigger tree pits, which would mean, I guess, bigger trees eventually. It's better for the trees, certainly. Yeah. Those are very small tree pits that okay. have existed. Okay, so Rich, you see if there are any of our guests. Well, Adam, Adam has, I think, Adam, you still have your hand up? Super quick question, yeah, just related to Janice, and maybe this was also covered in the read ahead, but was there an option to relocate the trees? I know that, you know, there, there are capabilities to kind of dig up and put the trees somewhere else. Was that explored? And what was the barrier to doing that? Robert, I, I, yeah. I believe that the, those things were taken out and removed, right, already? Sure, and just to answer the question a little better, there would be no room in this particular area. You'd have to build new tree pits. Um, the trees were actually in poor condition when they were taken down as well, probably because of the small tree pits. Um, uh, that would be uh, New York City Parks and Forestry yeah. <clears throat> Division. They explored all options. I'll tell you that just because it was a contract requirement to take down the trees, it was it was not easy to get the permits. So they definitely did explore all the options, but you know, and the direction just, was was from parks on how on what we did with the trees and how we moved forward and compensated them, restored them. Okay, so uh, yeah, there are no more questions. Do, we, do any of our attendees have questions, Rich? Yeah, yeah, let me let me look. But as I'm looking, and since this has been underway for a little while. The project's been going on for a little more than a month or two months, I guess. Now, have there been any issues with uh, with uh, with accident traffic caused by this? I mean, it's kind of a key, um, you know, a juncture there. Robert, or sure, I could take that. Um, yeah, the it's a valid concern, right? It is very busy. The Holland Tunnel over there, Sixth Avenue. Um, as the contractor, we have a significant. Uh, flaggers at the gate, at the entry gate at all times, right? We have one full time and then during deliveries, uh, we can have up to up to six flaggers. Um, it's a very temporary disruption to back a tractor trailer in. Um, we, you know, we usually have to stop traffic very briefly uh, with the flaggers and then continue them through. So um, I haven't heard any complaints. Uh, there's a, a large police presence for, for traffic in this area as well, especially for the Holland Tunnel. We've had no issues with them. Um, so I think any interruptions have been very brief just to stop traffic to back in a, a delivery. Well, may, maybe you can stay on for the third topic today, the Canal Street pump station, because I, I think it's right. going to, I think it, the fact that it's across the street may um, may may make this uh, even more difficult. And uh, it's going to be eating up uh, Duarte Square and the demapped uh, uh, the street there. So right. uh, you, they, know, it, you they, remind me that I have another question too. We, you talked about traffic and how about noise? You know, the construction noise, have you had complaints? Or, or I heard that you were talking about DEP monitoring and having your own company monitor it, but wondered if there yes, were- Yes, we, we, we have not had any significant complaints since the project started. So as we mentioned, we are monitoring both for noise and vibration um, constantly during the work. Um, and so far, we have been in the allowable levels. 
for construction sites. Um, and of course, if, if we get a complaint, we'll go back and we'll look at the data we've collected from the monitoring equipment to make sure that we were in that kind of level and we are taking um, you know, other noise mitigation measures. But there is, of course, you know, it is an active construction site, so there will be um, noise associated with the project, but we're trying to limit it as, as much as we as we can, but there will still definitely be, um, like I said, noise that's associated with the kind of work that we're doing. Thank you. So Rich, do we have anybody of our attendees? I'm sorry, I was on mute. Darlene Lutz is up first and I've allowed her, to, uh, she has talking permitted turned on now. Hello, good evening, everybody. Uh, I am, hello. Are you with us? Yes, we can hear, I can hear. Oh, you can, I can't. Oh, that's interesting. No wonder you always miss my announcements, Shirley. <laughs> 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 On the first precinct, uh, community council. Uh, I am not in here tonight in that respect. Uh, I am Darlene Lutz. I am a resident of community board two. My address is 80 Varick Street, which has been my home since 1980. Most of you know my story, but for those of you who don't, I'll go through it quickly. I'm my, my fourth floor unit faces and sits over the Trinity Church Wall Street vacant lot property at 76 Varick Street. Um, I appreciate this presentation. Um, obviously, because of the location where I live, I'm well aware of everything that's been going on uh, for the last two months. Um, what I was surprised about and surprised not to hear tonight is that 76 Varick Street, the former home of uh, Gitano, the bang and party bar, uh, is uh, being used by the MTA for this project. Uh, and uh, had I been given uh, video privileges, uh, you could see exactly what I'm talking about. 30,000 square feet of staging area for the Grand Canal Court. Uh, project. Um, this started, they started loading in last Tuesday, just about a week ago. Um, and uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, you know, staging ground is a little benign uh, sounding uh, because it's a full fledged construction site. Um, uh, there are, there's a significant issue right now, immediately that uh, that lot uh, was last used uh, by the Jackie Robinson Museum for a pop-up. It was hopefully, the, it was, I was told it was the last one after the 15 or 20 that have gone on in that lot since 2011. Um, it is, uh, it has no gravel left on it. It is 100% uh, bare, dirt ground. It now Thank has you. fleets of trucks tearing around on it. The pollution is going into the air. It is coming into my home. And uh, they were, you know, I, I asked Trinity back in last July, I said, can you regravel it now? But we're waiting for the skyscraper. So uh, I would uh, also like to uh, speak about how the traffic, how the trucks are entering in and out of that lot That's and how they, are, how they are taking equipment over to across 6th Avenue because they're using Grand, they're using Duarte, they're using the pedestrian, they're going over the sidewalk, over the, over the bike lane. There's, there's no protection there. Uh, for pedestrians, the bikes, there's an active city bike stand. Um, yes, that's dangerous. I am, you know, bringing that in, yeah, but let me, my main concern. Let me let him answer. Let's let him answer. My now. main concern is that I have 30,000 square feet of open dirt across the street, 30 feet from where I live. It is pouring into my home. 
pouring. And it could have been prevented. So, and the horse is out of the barn. Um, <laughs> uh, Darlene, I'm just going to say you are a couple, a couple minutes over the two minutes. So let's, uh, I'm going to have to cut you off there and we're going to let folks answer. Okay. Thank you. If we can, we'll get back to you. That'll be the chair's decision. Thank you. Would, would uh, MTA like to respond? So certainly uh, we shouldn't have any unsafe situations or conditions where we're staging. It's something we have to go back and look at and talk with the contractor about. So, and thank you for just bringing that to our attention. It's something that we'll go back and look at. Okay. But I, 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 I'm sorry, this is Rich. Again, how, how you guys are aware of this other project that's going to start across the street? Oh, because I, I, I imagine on that site. They're gonna want to, yeah. I, I, I'm not, but we would have to check. We would have to the, check the, here if they've been well, in the, contact I, with I, us. I don't, we don't I know the, the I don't know the schedule of that other work. Um, mm -hmm. Jimmy or the contractor well. here. Send no, I'm, I'm not aware of anything. It's going to offer. begin next year, I believe. That they're here to tell us about it. Do yeah. we have any more folks asking questions or commenting from our? Yeah, guests? we've got uh, Jeffrey's up next. Uh, Jeffrey Rowland. Okay, Jeffrey. You can hear can me. Elevate him. Yeah, we can hear Hello. you. Okay. Yes. yes. Uh, this is probably picking up on what you said earlier, Rich, and probably addressing more to Robert. Um, the um, the piles that he talked about. Uh, I know something about construction. I've been living next to a construction site where they've been using a Camacho to drill pile that they then fill with cement. So I understand this. Um, a three foot diameter pile filled with cement and they're gonna go down to bedrock and bedrock is at least 70 feet down, I'm sure over there, if not deeper. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a volume of cement that requires many cement trucks. Once they start to pour, they do not stop pour. Uh, and it's important that they keep the con continuity going. Now, the problem I have with that is I don't wanna see them start a pour on Friday, uh, after noon, because the traffic that will develop from now during this project and the warmer months will make it impossible for them to get their trucks through in a timely fashion. Um, you pretty much are trapped in that area. Uh, I live on Thompson Street, so I'm fully aware that sometimes on a Thursday or Friday afternoon, the traffic will be backed up to Houston Street on Thompson Street um, to get to the Holland Tunnel. So there's no way you're coming down Thompson and there's no way you're coming down West Broadway, and there's no way you're going across Grand because you can't get to Grand without going down Barrick, and Barrick is backed up to uh, Clarkson or above. And so it is very, it would be very bad planning to um, have any cement work done, any large cement work done um, on, on a Friday afternoon or Friday period, because if you have to do a continuous pour, um, you will not be able to get all your trucks in until way past the traffic time which means that the construction that day will end up going into the late hours, which will be unfortunate for those who do live nearby. Uh, as I said, I live on Thompson Street, but I don't think I live near enough to be disturbed by that. But I'd like to know if your contractor is fully aware of the traffic conditions on those afternoons surrounding the, um, the, the site, because frankly, Canal Street's impassable. Um, Sixth Avenue will be impassable. Uh, Barrack Street will be impassable. And so will Thompson Street. Robert, how long or how much more time do we need with the C camp pouring? So just to uh, speak to that a little bit, the C camp piles um, isn't the bigger concern for concrete. We pour one a day. It's uh, three trucks a day. It's about twenty-two cubic yards. Um, the that is a valid concern when we start pouring the structure, the slab, the walls, and the roof. Um, those will be fairly large pours. You know, uh, upwards of hundred cubic yards a day. Uh, and just to speak to what he's saying, we are unfortunately intimately aware of the traffic concerns. Uh, this may be too much information, but we're bound by um, uh, specifications where a truck uh, is called timing out, where we have to pour that truck within 90 minutes of it leaving. Yes, I, 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 I understand that. Plant. That's why I'm concerned about Fridays. Yep. So uh, from just from a pure constructability standpoint, we, we wouldn't be able to do it because we wouldn't be able to even to get the trucks there in time. So we plan on... Uh, planning out concrete pours accordingly. So presumably that means you will not be- uh, Battle the morning traffic a little bit, Friday. but not to go late. Wait, 
Robert, I think, cut off, or at least he cut off on my end. Are your concrete pours geared towards the earlier hours of the morning? Robert, you're frozen. I mean, while he's frozen, I just want to say we have every interest in maintaining and advancing the schedule. So while the, the traffic is significant concern, obviously, um, we can't rule out entire days of the, of the work week where we're constructing this to do this critical work. So we can discuss it further, see what he has in mind when he comes back on. Robert, can you hear me? I think it's still cut off, um, uh, Luke. But it, for the next four months, at least, when we uh, when we are installing secant piles, that's not a problem. It's going to come up afterwards when we are pouring for the structure. So the secant pile concrete delivery is not the issue? No, it's not the issue, yeah. OK. Um, and the last one we had was uh, uh, Pete. L let, me, let me go to uh, Pete uh, Davies here. Uh, Pete, you're 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 okay to talk now. Great, thank you. Um, given the city's policy for ADA access into subway stations, and given the fifty million dollar budget for this job, can we expect that at the end of it there will be ADA access into the station there on the north side of Canal and the east side of Sixth uh, Avenue? This is not a, a station project. This is a power project. So we're constructing a substation. So there's no ADA component to this. Um, we could check to see- No where ADA there, what? There's no ADA accessibility component to this because it's not a station project. But we can check to see where that station falls, Canal on 8th Avenue line, correct? Is what you're interested in? Uh, yeah, there's a staircase right across the street. Um, like I said, it's not no ADA work, elevator work, access is a part of this contract. This is a power substation construction project. But we can get back to you on the timeline for Canal on the 8th Avenue line, the AC, E, and F. We can get back to you with information on where that falls with our plan. As you know, we've recently, well, we will actually discuss later on tonight. We've committed to making the system 95% accessible through agreements with a class action lawsuit, which is sort of tangentially related to this project. Okay, and uh, could you just use this map here and show us the routes from the staging area lot on the east west side of Duarte from that lot to the construction site? Yeah, Robert, if, if, in if, if, yeah, if somebody can, because I, I, I won't be able to show it on the screen, oh, but there's a, there's multiple gates from that staging area. There's one out to, to uh, Grand Street, uh, one out to Canal Street. We are using the, the uh, Grand Street to 6th Avenue um, right now. If you move the mouse right there, pretty much right there, and then to 6th, yep, right around, yep. <laughs> Exactly. Um, we are not allowed to do anything on the DMAP Street or Durante Square. Um, no gates, no access in and out of the site, and nothing across there. So we'd have to come out to a main road um, using flaggers and uh, and around Thompson Street or to 6th using flaggers. So you go down 6th against traffic? If we flag traffic to back at the intersection, we can, if not, we loop around Thompson, all the way around Thompson. And what about the entry into the lot at the southern end at Canal and uh, Dead Street Sullivan? We are not allowed to use any access in and out to the Dead, the dead Street. You say you're not using the entry into the lot at Canal Street? Not using Sullivan Street. Not using Sullivan Street. We could use Canal. We can't use anything on Sullivan. You, you're coming out of, mostly coming out of this lot north onto Grand Street. And then heading east. So, right. 
I would advise the committee to take a site visit. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can people hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. good. I'm back on again. Um, I think, are we done with our- Yeah, we're, we're set. It's okay. coming on. Okay. We're no, on no, to, no. Uh, it's 7.30. We, it's yes. almost We're we moving like on. Okay. Can you uh, remove your um, presentation, please, so we can move on to the next- yeah, stop sharing. The stop sharing. Yeah, stop, in other Thank words, you. stop sharing. Thanks so much. And uh, I will just give a little brief introduction myself, uh, just to tell you that two members of the Traffic and Transportation Committee have been working on a transportation accessibility project, which means both transit and streets. Uh, but tonight, we're talking about transit accessibility and uh, the two members are uh, Amy uh, and Natasha Avanasians, who's here tonight. And Natasha, I'm just gonna hand this over to you. Could you just give us a little overview of what yeah. we're expecting to see tonight and how it ties in with your project? Yes, um, so thank you, Shirley. And I mean, just first and foremost, Melissa and Luke, thank you so much for taking the time, you guys and your team. Um, I guess just really briefly, you know, Community Board District 2, we have an incredibly historic and beautiful district, but with that comes a lot of challenges um, in terms of cost and construction when it when it comes to upgrading our infrastructure to make it much more accessible. Um, I do want to, though, highlight tonight all the great work that the MTA is doing to find alternatives to subway accessibility. Um, some of them have been listed below. So, you know, just wanted to be able to share that with the committee here and, you know, in business session, be able to discuss ways that we can support the MTA and expanding on these accessibility projects. Thank you. Right, and, and so tonight we actually have four accessibility projects. So when we say number two, it's really four updates. So whoever is going to be presenting uh, the first one is on the class action settlement to make 95% of subway stations disabled accessible by 2055. And okay. whoever is going to talk about that, identify um, yourself. Uh, it will be me, Shirley. Shirley. Oh, okay, um, Melissa. Luke and I will I'll go through what we have and then we'll answer questions. I'm just going to share my screen again. Okay. And while she's bringing it up, I just want to uh, manage expectations. We prepared um, just four updates, brief updates mm -hmm. on these additional items. If you guys want a more substantive discussion at some point, we're happy to come back. Obviously, we'll we're happy to take oh, all great. the questions you have on this. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we're really looking forward to to seeing these updates. Uh, so the first would be the ninety five percent. Lawsuit. Lawsuit. Class oh, right, yeah. Hold on. I have it out of order. I think you just passed, you passed it. it. Right? Yeah, sorry. It's an ADA I told you it was brief when I was managing your expectations earlier. Oh, yeah. Go back. I think it's ADA settlement. Where did I? Where did I? Why am I missing going? I'll here. tell you when. Like, or sorry. No, sorry. Wait, wait, I was going to. No, keep no. going. I'm oh, sorry. It's going it to. It says close. ADA. Here we That's go. it. That's there we it. go. Sorry, sorry about that. I was so okay. too quick with the clicker. So for the ADA um, settlement for the class action suit. So as you know, in June of 2022, the MTA and accessibility advocates reached a class action settlement agreement to make 95% of subway stations ADA accessible by 2055. And so this agreement will make another 400, um, I'm sorry, 346 stations accessible. And it builds off the commitment to accessibility in our current 2020 to 2024 capital program, which includes ADA for 70 substations. And that also includes the current work we're doing at the 14th Street station complex uh, at 6th and 7th Avenues to make that station ADA accessible. And just so, for background, these are two class action lawsuits that were filed against the MTA. One was, I think, 20. 17 and one was 2019, basically in various ways, um, alleging that the MTA was not meeting ADA requirements. 
in building out accessibility in our system. So this, um, this settlement is truly a great historic moment. It's a great commitment from the um, MTA to advance accessibility. And the part where we say that we're building off of our commitment in the current capital program, we have capital programs that run in five-year increments. The current one began in 2020, ends in 2024. Another one will pick up in, in 25 and go to 29. And that's how we run them. And this current capital program, we committed to identifying and committed to making 70 um, New York City transit stations ADA compliant, so fully accessible to people with mobility issues and disabilities um, through means of installing um, elevators and ramps to solve vertical access issues so that you could navigate the whole system there in each of those stations without having to use stairs. And this is usually prior to that, each capital program would have something like 10 to 20 ADA projects since ADA, the ADA Act was passed in the 90s. So um, having 70 is, was historic in and of itself. That was a $5.2 billion commitment by the MTA to building out accessibility, which was unprecedented and historic. And with this settlement, we are now basically committing to keep that pace or better going forward until we're done with this um, at 2025. And when we say 95% rather than 100, it's really we plan, our goal is to make the system as accessible as possible based on engineering feasibility and the various constraints we have. There are some stations that pose significant constraints for one reason or another that I don't have to get into here. But the goal is maximum accessibility. Um, and this is, you know, a great thing to highlight. Okay, well, thank you. So um, now I guess we go to committee members again. And uh, do you have questions? Raise your hand if you have questions. Um, Rich, do you see if anyone has questions? I'm, I'm concerned about because I'm picking that. Adam, I think Adam, Adam has Adam. a question. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think it was our June or July resolution on this topic where we kind of looked at the, the style that the elevators that are being put in are, but can you hear, sorry. Um, so it, it looks like most of these projects that are underway today, you have kind of twice the number of elevators as would be necessary if you were just bringing people straight down to the platform, right? You bring people down to the, uh, the, the mezzanine fair or the right, yeah. fair, yeah, the fair, yeah, the fair, the fair level, and then you build another elevator to you know take them down all the way to the platform. Yeah. So kind of a couple, you know, we made a couple observations on that. Number one, right. it doubles construction costs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, number two, it slows down substantially the time, you know, the the trip for somebody who's coming to the platform using the uh, uh, the elevator. So two questions. So given you know, the advent of the Omni system, will you explore single elevator trips, you know, with tap to pay on the outside of the elevator? Yeah, so I have good news. So go ahead, sorry, I don't want to. Oh, no, no, you, if, if, if you got good news, cut me yeah, off. So the answer is yes, yeah. so we recognize that as well. And so with all of the new elevators in the packages that we are putting out through awards now, we're looking for the most effective and simple options for getting customers from the street level into a train. And so we're not, so for example, there's in one of the upcoming packages, uh, and I say packages because we're in order to um, take advantage of cost savings in design and procurement, we are bundling these stations together and awarding single contracts that have multiple um, stations in them and having a contractor construct them. And we have, for example, I, I just did some outreach on the um, BC line for the Museum of Natural History. And there's that, that station, if you're familiar, has you know, two levels with uh, each directional train service going, you know, stacked on top of each other to be served by one elevator. So we don't have to have the customers that use elevators split their, their travel just to get to the fare array. And it involves some creative thinking about how we design the stations. We move the fare array um, in certain circumstances so that 
it's in a different location or oriented differently so that the elevator is in the unpaid area completely. So all of that, what you're saying, we are looking at because we want to take advantage of the cost savings and the schedule and time savings so we can build out as much accessibility as possible with our, our limited budgets. And Omni plays a role in that. That's great news. Thank you so much for that update. Yeah, you got it. I don't see, um, oh, let me get, we're back. Uh, Janine wants to uh, speak. She's in the attendees uh, list there. Um, if uh, I'm unmuted. Yeah, Janine. Um, did, did the same rules apply for uh, developer or when developers put in elevators? I, we're, we, we're waiting details on a new elevator that will probably be coming to um, the Sixth Avenue and Spring Street entrance for the CE train. Um, but um, if you're familiar with that station, you have to enter on the west side if you want to go downtown and the east side if you go uptown. So you would either need two elevators or need to be able to access both sides of the station. Um, so how does how does that work when there is a new elevator being added by a developer? Are they subject to the same ADA settlement requirements? So the ADA settlement that we have just means that we have to build out the system to that 95% and add these 346 stations to make the system basically accessible from end to end. Um, I believe in that, and I don't want to speak too much about that specific project, but there are projects throughout the city that when, when they're undergoing ULER, which is the, you guys know, the uniform manuscript review process, if they trigger a requirement because they are um, their development is impacting the capacity at a, at the station, they're in the adjoining station during the review process. That's determined. You know those kinds of things can trigger developers to have to um, mitigate that. And it's not a, it's not necessarily an elevator that is a requirement. However, based on the <coughs> law, and not to get too far into it, if you change the egress. In a significant way, uh, in a station that would that that can serve as a trigger for having to build ADA compliant vertical access. So, you know, if a new entrance is required due to capacity um, constraint, so we have to build a new stairway, for example, that potentially would trigger the need for an elevator since we're building that stair. So, I'm not sure specifically about the facts of that case, but that's an instance where developers are a part of having to do their, their mitigation, build elevators, construct some accessibility goals. Okay, thank uh, That's you. outside of this, 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 that's not, that's sort of like it, the details of the settlement. The, the settlement just means we have to ensure and take the steps by that timeline to, and, and in increments if you read the settlement, to meet the goals of accessibility. All these other things happen on the side if uh, with developers based on external development happening, which we're not a part of, but they come to us if they're in proximity to our station. Okay. Um, am I being heard again? Yeah. Oh, good. I guess I have a couple. I actually have oh. a couple of questions. Um, the test actually has to do with the tools that are being used for accessibility, which we know, of course, elevators. And I just wondered, are, are escalators also part of that program? Escalators are not an ADA compliant um, <laughs> mechanism or, really? or component in the station. It has to be for somebody that cannot use stairs. Is that's So elevators are ramps, ADA compliant ramps that have a specific grade. So escalators don't are not part of that solution. Although we look to install escalators where needed based on the depth of the station and how, much, how many stairs people have to traverse. Before we take any other questions, I just want to let the, if we're done fully with Canal Court, I'd like to let the Canal Court specific team go and just me and Melissa will hang on. Yeah, just uh, Luke, before you let them go, can we just agree on, on what you guys agreed to follow up on? 
Um, so you guys want a site visit, right? Or you want us to get back to you about the staging in the lot. Yeah, that's, I think, There's the main. concerns there. Um, we understand that. And you want a site visit? So we can reach out and coordinate that. Um, I'm going to talk to GOT and Parks about possibility of just a temporary pop-up yeah. basketball court of some kind for kids. Um, can you just confirm uh, what you said about the court not being closed the entire time that the project is under construction? Right. So the court is closed to the public for two years of the, I think, three-year construction project. So it was closed in September or October, or I forget when we took it over, but it was closed to the public last year and it will reopen next year in September. Rebuilt, reopened for use as a basketball court. Parks, will, Parks Department is in charge of planting the new trees, but we'll, we will provide the tree pits for them and the water fountain and stuff. So all that will be coordinated with parks, and that is a primary goal of, of the construction project on the government relations side, obviously, if not the contractor, to make sure we get that part back. So thank you very much. Is there any fun. other things that you heard tonight about this project that have influenced your thinking? The feedback we received. Mm -hmm. I want to get a better handle on the staging on that lot. Absolutely. On Barrett, yeah. 76 Barrett. That, Lot. We need to know, um, make sure that our occupancy of that lot coincides or works with the future development that you guys are speaking of. There's a tower to be built there, I believe. So, concerns about the traffic and concrete pours, all that is noted. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. Um, Shirley, do you see Michael's hand? If you're, uh, unless you have another question or so. Can I cut them loose? Oh, yes. I'm sorry, Luke. Yes, you, I, I think so. Yeah. Jimmy, I, Robert, anybody else from Canal Court? You guys can go. Melissa and I will finish up on the other items. Thank you. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Because I'm in and out. I want to finish up on the 95% um, uh, accessible stations and wonder if that included the smaller stations. We have many small stations in our area. And I wondered if that included it. And I wondered if ramps play a part in that because of them being uh, at least smaller. Could you address that? Ramps, ramps certainly play a part. It's So we obviously prioritize our station selection at the outset based on transfer, based on usage, location. Um, with this capital program, we have a goal of scattering around the transit map in such a way that customers would not be more than two stations away from an accessible station. And then we would infill from there. There's a lot, we're less than half accessible. So there's a lot we have to do. And we've been focusing on the, um, you know, peppering the map accordingly and hitting up the stations that have transfers, high usage, are near cultural institutions, um, we look at demographic data, so seniors, people with disabilities, if there's, you know, communities with those identifiers that we can incorporate in our analysis when we're citing, picking, and, and identifying stations. Um, so that there's that. And then ramps certainly factor into our use. So there are some stations that use ramps. The problem with ramps, especially in Manhattan, ramps take a, a significant amount of length to have as a as a functional ADA compliant you know path of travel. Um, one of the stations we, we're going to get an update on also is 14th Street and there's a part of that project right now that closes the passageway between 6th Avenue and 7th Avenue at 14th Street and it's all to regrade that passageway to make it ADA compliant. You can't have something steep. So in Manhattan, especially, ramps, you're unlikely to see ramps. You're more certainly more likely to see elevators because you don't uh -huh. have real estate to put in ramps with long, 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 long pathways. Oh. But there are stations that do have ramps. In Brooklyn, I can think of a couple. If you're ever in Coney Island, Stillwell Avenue Station has both. 
I don't know if it actually has elevators. Okay, I was simply asking about ramps because I thought they take up less room and no, they take all for the oh. smaller stations. I withdraw that. Uh, yeah. And as far as the remaining five percent, I presume we can ask you back sometime so you can tell us all about that. What might be the plans for the remaining five percent? What are the plans for them? I mean, yeah. when we can get to the night, I mean, we'll not now. You don't have to now. We have a lot of other yeah. things waiting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Michael Levine, I see you've been waiting. Yes, thank you. I have one quick follow-up question on the goal for 95% accessibility, which is dependent here upon elevators. Elevators do have a way of breaking down from time to time. What procedures will you have in place if an elevator breaks down? Will there be alternatives? Will there be sufficient signage on the outside of the subway stations to warn those who plan to use it that the <coughs> elevator is out of service? Have you thought about how you would deal with yeah. out of service with elevators? Yeah, absolutely. So you can sign up right now. You can sign up for alerts on and you can get escalator and elevator outage information. Um, that's one of the concerns we have. And one of the things that we've been looking at creatively to solve, and one of the reasons why having fewer elevators in a station also benefits customers because you know if you're if there's a, and if we're able to get a, a station served by a single elevator to all platforms, all direct both directions, well then a customer would know at street level if the elevator is out, and not take one functional elevator to a, a fare array only to discover they can't go anywhere past that. So we're looking at cre all creative ways to manage the maintenance issues that come along with elevators. They're mechanical, so unfortunately they do break down. We do respond to make repairs. Some of the issues with elevators that you should be aware of is they're often custom fit to the specific geometry of each station. And that's also why you see escalators out for an inordinate amount of time. They're not the dimensions are not mass produced and, and so that limits our scalability. They have to be custom made when we repair or install to the specific geometries in each of these stations, which are mostly 100 years old. Um, but I will say we are innovating in our procurement, so in our procurement process. So one of the um, bundles of package of elevators that we're looking to award eventually has a maintenance component involved in it. And I forget the duration, maybe 20 years post installation. So traditionally, a contractor will build the elevator for us at a station and hand it over to us and they're gone. And we're exploring procurement innovations where the contractor builds the elevator and then is on the hook to be the maintainer as well. And that'll that's new. And we want to see how that works and improves um, potentially improves the uh, maintenance of the elevators we receive from contractors. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's good news. I think I'm out again. Do you hear me? Yep, you're there. Okay, you're well, there. then, in that case, let's get to our next uh, well, a Pete, presentation, Pete Davies had, which is Pete the 14th, had, um, 14th Street elevator installation. Who's going to be presenting? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be doing Hold on. I just have to. Um, did you call me, Rick? Pete, maybe, maybe, Pete, can you can you bundle your questions until uh, the end of this section? And, and maybe you can ask. Yeah. Me. You may have a question uh, in this one as well. So. Okay. It's an elevator question. Sure. Yeah. The, the, here's an elevator question. Here's an elevator topic coming up. So. Okay. So this is a. Uh, Quick, as we've mentioned, we came with some quick updates for on a couple of topics. Um, so for the 14th Street Complex ADA, uh, we have an update where we are uh, making both the 14th Street and 6th Avenue and the 14th Street, 7th Avenue stations um, ADA accessible. So at 14th Street and 6th Avenue, we're installing, um, we're in the process of installing six new elevators, uh, new street stair, and refurbishment of other stairs, as well as platform and mezzanine, the mezzanine areas that serve the L, F, and M lines. And then also at 14th Street and 7th Avenue, where we'll be installing three new elevators, a new street stair, and also includes refurbishment of stairs, platforms, and the mezzanine areas that serve the one, two, and three lines. Um, this was a contract that was awarded in December of 2021, and the estimated 
completion date for the project is in the third quarter of 2024. So right now what's happening at the stations is at the, we're currently at the Northeast corner of 14th Street and 6th Avenue. And this is for the installation of three elevators. Um, and this is goes back to kind of one of the questions that somebody um, comments that somebody brought up before. Um, we have a street, um, a street elevator that's going to go to the, both the upper and lower mezzanine levels at the station. And then there's two mezzanine to platform elevators to go to the, um, the F and M lines and then down to the um, lower level for the L. And the next thing that's happening, as you know, um, this Monday we closed the um, passageway between 6th and 7th Avenues. Um, to, um, I'm sorry, I, I skipped around, to um, reconstruct that passageway to bring that into ADA compliance. So that is a, a ramp situation there. We're going to redo that um, there. And then we also are working on the southwest corner of 6th Avenue and 14th Street. We just started there. We closed the street stair um, to begin the elevator installation there. And then we also have work progressing on the southwest corner at 14th Street and 7th Avenue, where we are in that station, we're installing three elevators. So there's one, the street elevator there is from the street to the mezzanine. And then once you're in the mezzanine, you go, there's a, an elevator to go one to each platform to the southbound and the northbound platform. Um, as I mentioned, we have a new street stair going in at that corner, and then there'll also be refurbishment of the other staircases in that station complex. And I think that's what I have on Yay. 14th Street and 6th and 7th Avenue. So do any committee members have questions on this? I don't see, I don't, I don't see any. Actually, and I, I have a couple of questions. Um, which, uh, oh, I think you, you were asked already about the separation of the trips and that probably in the near future, in the future, you will be having a more continuous trip on, on the elevators, I think had been said. And- um, Yeah, well, that's a goal of ours to streamline yeah. all that, yeah. Okay, good. And um, so, and these are also part of the class action settlement work, right? No, this is part of the capital program that we already committed to. Oh, well, it's a part of the capital program. Okay, fine, so it's, it's separate. Mm -hmm. And we had seen um, in the tip that there was some reference to uh, replacement of stations at Canal Lafayette, I think it was, and uh, 14th and 8th Avenue. And uh, so that would be not be part of this project. That would be a separate kind of thing, right? Um, if they're elevator replacements, it's not, this doesn't count as part of any settlement or anything. The settlement is to make stations that are currently not accessible mm -hmm. to make them accessible. The elevator replacements, escalator replacements, that's just part of useful life. Elevators that are just old and need to be replaced. That, yeah, that's I'm, also- I'm, I'm just curious, how, how often do they replace usually? I, you know, off the top of my head, I think it's like a 20 year useful life, depends on the use. 20 year life. Oh. And it's probably more varies, I guess. Okay, and there was something somewhere in relation to this, I talked about accessible stairways. And could you describe what that is? There's something called progressive accessibility, progressive ADA, and that can sometimes mm -hmm. be confusing. That those are like components that you'll see like the um the raised, like beaded um yellow strips on a platform that signify to somebody that's vision impaired, for example that they're getting close to the edge of the platform um, oh. or railings that are also compliant to ADA, but it's not the entire stairwell. The stairs in and of themselves are not a complete ADA accessibility um, installation. So we would have, have to have something, some vertical access mechanism, either a ramp or an elevator that bypasses the stairs themselves. But when we do that work, we have to, in a station, we have to also account for progressive ADA, which are the little things like I told you, like the warning strips, 
um, and other things for people that are vision impaired or have hearing issues or something like that, that have mobility capacity so they can use the stairs, but the stairs need railings that are better or something. Uh, like okay, thanks. Different okay. levels. So do we have any uh, of our guests that want to uh, comment or ask questions, Rich? Uh, um, I don't know, Pete, I Pete, do you have a question that's or pertinent to this? Sure, maybe. Um, yeah, well, my, my, I'm suggesting or asking the committee or the MTA to, for forward looking, uh, we have a large development that's just been announced at Broadway and uh, Canal. And there's another development underway at the lot that's being used for staging uh, that uh, both of which would be well served by ADA elevators. So I don't know if those are in the pipeline for ADA access, but I would um, hope that the MTA, uh, we, we tried when a building was before city planning at Broadway and Canal on the other side of the street, but the uh, city planning agreed it would be great to have one there, but it was too constricted of a site. The site across the street that's now been announced for development is a much larger site. Uh, so just looking forward, I'm suggesting or asking if those are under consideration. I'm not aware that they are, um, but it's something that we can take a look at. Is, is this something where you, if we submitted recommendations, it would be of any help? Well, I mean, it depends on, I don't know the specific, specifics of these construction projects. So if it's as of right, based on the existing zoning, mm -hmm. I don't think there's any opportunity for you to weigh in necessarily, right? Um, well, not that that would preclude, preclude you from doing so, but um, then there are other examples. Like I said, if there's environmental review or if it meets certain other standards. Okay. All right. I think we'll move on to the open stroller pilot. Are you ready for that one? Melissa, are you going to do that one too? I am ready, surely. Okay. Ready. Okay. So for the open stroller pilot, um, the MTA launched this pilot in September of 2022 to provide a designated space to park an open stroller. Uh, it's on seven bus routes. It's piloted on seven bus routes, the VX23, the B1, the M31 in Manhattan, Q12 and Q50 in Queens, and the S53, S93 routes um, that run between Staten Island and Brooklyn. So buses with a designated stroller area will have a sticker with a stroller symbol on the outside of the bus near the, door, near the front door. And the designated stroller areas are located near the rear door and are marked with the prominent decals. And we have an example here. So this is what the decals look like to inform people that the, the bus they're boarding has um, an opportunity to keep the stroller open in the designated area. Um, so currently the MTA is collecting customer feedback and reporting stroller usage on the the routes we currently have um, the open areas on. And over 2,500 stroller journeys have been tallied since the beginning of the pilot. On this January, we announced the expansion of the pilot to 1,000 local and SBS bus routes um, across the boroughs. And details on those routes will be announced soon. And we've also included, um, if anybody wants more information on this or has feedback to give because you use the stroller on our buses. The, you can go to our website, mta.info, it's backslash stroller. Um, we can provide this information to, to um, Shirley to share with the board. And that is the update on the stroller policy. Okay. Uh, any questions on that from anybody? Hey, Shirley, it's Natasha. Um, okay. I'm very excited about this pilot. I just had my daughter three months ago and um, really looking forward to to using this when I take the bus with her soon. Um, it, you know, in addition to doing 
um, a resolution. Are there any ways that you guys could recommend, you know, whether it's, you know, submitting a formal letter or working with our elected officials uh, to make sure that the pilot expands to one of the bus routes that goes through our community? Any suggestion you have, um, any way you want to communicate that, you should. There's, you should go to this website and and provide that feedback. You okay. can send us, um, and I think you, you don't have to send a formal letter. You can just send me or Melissa an email with the routes that you want considered. We'll share that directly with the uh, individuals making the decisions. Uh, we haven't seen, Melissa and I haven't seen the routes that, they're, that are under consideration yet. There'll be an announcement soon. Um, so just, you know, today, like tonight, tomorrow, whatever, send the routes that you're looking for. Thanks. We'll pick it up. Okay. And uh, I assume we don't have any guests, Rich, who... No. Uh, uh, Lois, uh, Lois has her hand Yes. Up. Lois. Lois. Oh, okay, I can't see. Hi, everyone. This morning. is a program long overdue, having little ones in my family and bags and strollers and whatnot. My question is, two questions. One, why did you choose those routes as the pilot routes? And two, when, you, when a person comes on to the bus with the stroller and the kids, do you walk through to the designated area? Or how do you, do you have to close your, I don't, I don't understand this. You walk through, say you go through the front, you mm -hmm. walk through the bus and yeah. keep your stroller open. Yeah. What What's the logistics? So all our buses, the entire fleet are ADA accessible. You don't have to go up any stairs to get onto the bus in front. The bus is all kneel. So you can just come on with the stroller, walk the stroller back, unfold it, and go to the designated area. You're not expected to fold it up. Previously, the rules, right. are not, um, you know the rules. And I know those. there were buses when I was growing up, and I'm sure you guys know, you all know, you had to go upstairs as well in the yeah. front. So none of that is the case on the fleet now. Um, so and and you me. share this, you share this with wheelchairs, the designated no, area? This is the designated area for strollers. It's and not, where do the wheelchairs go? They still have wheelchair specific areas of the bus. This is a different area entirely. So it's and not a zero sum game where you have we're pitting people with young children and strollers against people in wheelchairs. This is Good. something we looked at closely. We were very concerned about, and the pilot was a limited launch, largely because we need to see how this happened, how this worked out. Um, and and why did you choose those routes? Yeah. So you know it was a combination of the rolling stock that we have, the ability to retrofit the buses, rolling stock of the vehicles and the ability to just manage and control the information so we could do a proper analysis of the usage. The drivers are recording these, the usage themselves. There isn't like a special code on the MetroCard or the Omni that shows you're coming in with a stroller. So um, it was just to make sure it was a controlled environment. We were getting good data and we could manage. I mean, honestly, there were concerns about conflict with with customers, you know, there are some some of these areas you have to lift up seats. So we wanted to see how this worked. It's brand new. It's a whole new way of, of looking at making the system accessible to a variety of users beyond ADA. So this is not ADA. This is accessibility beyond that. Really broadening what terrific means, and and to make sure we're not discouraging the use of the system by people that can't use it because. They'd be expected to fold up their shoulder and hold a baby. Oh, horrible. And I agree with Natasha. When is it coming to our community? You just, I mean, I don't know if, who wants to take the lead. One email to me or Melissa. Um, I, you know, can't guarantee that it will be the buses you want, the routes you want, but we will share that information, share it to this hot as a follow-up to this meeting. No issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And individually, you guys can can go to the website and, and give your feedback. But I just asked for one official email from the board, whoever wants to pen that. Doesn't Thank you. Formal you. Good. Um, I don't see any more questions. 
Well, it's, uh, um, Shirley, you still there? Shirley, I think you're on mute. We had one more thing. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think there's one more topic. Yeah. Yep, Shirley's there. Yep. Well, I don't. Know. I think Shirley. we can move on to the eHealth pilot. Yeah, and then wrap up. The last one. Please. Please. We yes, please do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is the eHealth pilot. I think I'm being heard again. Yes. Uh, you have it right on. So go ahead, Melissa. Okay, thank you. So for the Accessorite eHealth pilot program update. Um, Phase one of the pilot began in 2017, and it continues with 1,200 customers with no limits on the number or distance of trips. Uh, customers self-schedule their own trips from a choice of three providers using provider-specific apps or phone numbers, and customers pay with 275 fare per ride. Um, next steps on this, we are reviewing the pilot and evaluating options for a potential phase two with that will focus on uh, customer benefits, scalability, and financial sustainability. Um, however, no determination on the next steps have been made at this time. So that's where we stand with the eHealth. So I'll turn it over to Shirley for who we hope can be heard. Okay, thanks, Melissa. We hear you. Uh, I do have some questions, but I see that some of my committee members do. So I'm going to call on Lois first. Lois, if you'd like to ask your question or did you have your hand raised from before? Lois? I think that was from before. It's, it's, okay. it's. Then, then we've got Janet Lewis. Sorry, Janet. from before. Okay. So take your hand uh, off. Uh, okay. So Janet, please. As, as part of this program, are you exploring? I mean, I know that there are handicapped accessible vans that, you know, work really well for wheelchairs. Are, are you doing any shared? Any incentives for shared rides? So the way eHealth works right now, it's not they're not shared. And we have three um, companies that customers can choose from that are in the pilot. Um, and so we're looking at all options on how to continue this program in an effective way. But it's um, a partnership with private with private providers. So Okay. So you okay. could encourage, or you could put that into some sort of RFP. Do you, do you put out an RFP to your providers? And, and could you ask for a certain you know, type of vehicle? Yeah, that could accommodate more than one person at a time, some sort of incentives. We'll have more information about our next steps soon, hopefully. I know that there's an, that we're working on it. Um, okay. Well, let me, let me, Take that back. Thank you. Sure. Okay, anyone else? Because I have a question while I can still be heard. Go for Should it. I go ahead. Rich, is there anyone from our guests? Uh, um, you go go ahead now that you're working. We have Valerie um, uh, De La Rosa wants to ask a question, but why don't you go first? Huh? Okay. Yeah, maybe while I can be heard, I can ask my, my questions, which I guess the first one is that I'm kind of surprised that it's still at the uh, 1200. I, I understood it was being increased to 2400. So what happened to that? It made no announcement beyond the current, just maintaining the current um, pool of customers in, the, in phase one of the pilot, or the, just the pilot of it. So. Oh, so as a as a pilot, so you're just simply repiloting it, okay? And I mean, uh, we don't. I, so we don't have a determination on what is happening next. We, there are lots of considerations that we need to factor in on what we're able to do with this program. Uh -huh. And so, well, unfortunately, okay. that's the that is just the update we have at this moment. Yeah, and you know, my, I was going to ask about feedback, but I'll bet the feedback was really very good and and wanting more right people like it yeah right and the other thing was is that i had heard something about and this was not to do with the vans but the that there was another program from accessoride which was not through taxis but that you could uh register and get an id card and then call and reserve a car in advance did i get that wrong so that sounds like the eHealth pilot. You're able to call amongst three providers 
to register just to schedule a trip or so use an it, app. It's not, oh, okay. I was told that that was with, um, you know, private entrepreneurs with their cars. So it isn't. It's just oh, is it, are you talking maybe Uber or Lyft or something? Well, not Uber or Lyft, but maybe some more independent. In other words, so this, uh, these are in with other private... words, cars, private cars rather than taxis. Is that part of the program? Yeah, it's a combination. There are taxis. There's It's three oh, companies, yeah. Arrow, Limosis, and Leap. And they have a variety of vehicles. Um, they're not all accessible in the full ADA sense. They're mm -hmm. not, um, you know, they're not like as accessible as a paratransit vehicle. So the program in, in and of itself is limited in who it can, who it can actually serve right now. So, but it involves private carriers. You schedule it yourself. You don't have to go through paratransit accessory to do that. You can use the phone number or if you're comfortable and have a smartphone and want to use an app, the provider provides you the app to use. Um, all you do is pay the fare, and then on the back end, the provider is reimbursed through NTA. Oh, okay. That, that's another one. Okay. That's uh, one. I see Valerie has her hand up. She's been waiting patiently. Hi. Uh, uh, turn. Thank you. Thank you, Luke and uh, uh, Melissa. Uh, my question is, um, in the current uh, eHale, Accessoride eHale pilot program, uh, is that um, accessible to um, people that are, have full Accessoride or um, that only have like half uh, privileges? I don't know what the formal name is. Um, I was just curious as to the participants in that program. Thank you. Um, it was available to, to my knowledge to our Accessoride customers, but it was it's closed now. The enrollment was based off of the 1200 number from 2017. Thank you. So we haven't expanded, but those are paratransit customer base. Okay, thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Luke. Do we have any more, Rich? I don't think so, no. Oh, hey, hey, we're sure. moving. So uh, thank you very much, MTA New York City Transit, for all yeah. your presentations, for all the information, for coming to give us the information. And now we're going to move on to DEP. And I think that probably at this point, we have elevated our guests. I think I had seen some. Yep. And uh, one is Alicia West. Is she on? I'm here. Hi. Yeah, Hi. I thought Thanks I saw you before, us. Alicia. Thank you. Um, can and, you also... uh, Matthew Osit is yep. here. I promoted him. He should. Yep. Uh... And, and um, Umberto Galarza. I got him here. Uh, Great. He's... That's it. OK. Thank you for waiting so patiently, <laughs> of course. people. <laughs> Okay. I have a lot of important oh, business yeah. tonight, and I learned a lot about the MTA, so thank you. Yes, and also, you know, the first item yes. is related. It's across the street from where you guys are doing yes. your project. I got the end of that one. So that... what the project is, right? It's, it's to build an upgraded replacement sewage pumping station yes. on the Canal and Sullivan Street, and that is adjacent to Duarte Square, so. Yes, absolutely. It. Um, so I've shared my screen here. Can you all see that? Yes. Yes. Okay, let me see if I can make it go to the slideshow. Let me just give up uh, uh, two seconds of context. Uh, uh, Alicia, uh, Ms. West came to um, Mark Diller and, and asked, you know, which committee should we uh, present to? Um, you know, we have this this thing that we're doing at Canal Street and the DMAP Sullivan Street. And uh, we talked about it and be, because we were having this combined meeting between Parks and Waterfront and open space and the traffic and transportation, we we thought it might be a good, a good to bring it in, especially since we were talking about the space right across the street earlier in the meeting. And so uh, Shirley and I and, and, and Mark and, and Janine all decided this was the best place to uh, hear this presentation, so. That's the background. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for having us tonight. Um, we have a pretty brief presentation that I will try to move through quickly, um, but understanding that these committees don't usually talk about uh, sewage pump stations, I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of background um, just about uh, what 
New York City Department of Environmental Protection does and how the sewer system works. Um, but first, I just want to properly introduce myself. My name is Alicia West, and I am DEP's Director of Public Design Outreach. Um, Matthew Ossett, who is the portfolio manager for this project um, from our Bureau of, of Engineering, Design and Construction is also here tonight to help answer any questions you may have. Um, and of course, I think Umberto Galarza, who's our Manhattan coordinator, who many of you may know, um, is also on the call as well. Um, all right. Um, so as some of you may know, uh, DEP's mission is to enrich the environment and protect public health for all New Yorkers by providing high quality drinking water from our upstate watershed, um, but also managing wastewater and stormwater. Uh, we also work to reduce air, noise, and hazardous material pollution. Um, on the wastewater side, uh, DEP treats over a billion gallons of sewage every single day at one of our at each of our 14 wastewater resource recovery facilities. Um, so that wastewater, which is both sanitary flow, so like from your toilet or your shower, for example, um, and storm flow when it rains and that rain drains to the corner catch basin and enters um, the sewer system, that that flow travels through 7,000 miles of sewers uh, throughout the city. And it does that largely by gravity. However, there are low points in the system. And at those low points, that's where we need something called a pump station. Um, and what these are doing, it's sort of implicit in the name, right? Like they are pumping the sewage back up to a higher elevation so that it can continue to move along its way in the underground sewer to treatment. Um, so there are 96 pump stations all across the city, and the Canal Street pump station is the one that we're here to speak about tonight. Okay, um, so a little bit about this pump station. Um, it was originally, <clears throat> excuse me, of course I'm losing my voice a little bit. Um, it was originally constructed in the 1930s, um, and it was last upgraded in the 1990s. Um, so the station serves residences and businesses in Soho, and it's routing wastewater and stormwater to our Newtown Creek wastewater treatment plant, which is in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Um, and there it is treated and released clean into the East River. Um, this uh, $23 million project is going to upgrade the entire pump station to meet our upgraded, our updated standards of safety, um, efficiency, and also resiliency. And it's also going to eliminate uh, the need for canals for Atlanta Canal Street to be closed um, during our routine maintenance of the station. Um, so that will be a benefit. Um, so here's a map to orient you. You've been talking a lot about this little corner of the neighborhood this evening. Um, so let me know if you can see my cursor and on the star here. So this is where our site is. You were talking with the MTA about this site across, across the Avenue of the Americas. Um, so we're on the, the northern sidewalk of Canal Street. Um, so the station is entirely underground, um, except for this green vent structure, which you can see here, which has this lovely patina of stickers all over it. Um, and you can also see the flush hatches on the sidewalk. Um, so those are our operator access points to the underground station here. Um, and when we're finished, we'll have new above ground vent stacks in, in approximately the same location. Um, so the existing station is going to remain operational while we build its replacement. Um, so we'll be relocating, we'll be locating the new subsurface infrastructure to a DEP sewer easement, um, which is shown here in blue um, on the DMAP Sullivan Street, which is adjacent to Duarte Square, which as you know is a Parks Department property. Um, that DMAP street is owned by Trinity um, and DEP's easement was established in that 2006 property acquisition. Um, so we'll be doing some work in the easement here and some work on public property on Canal Street. And I'll get in a little more detail in a moment. Um, so here's a photo looking west from Duarte Square. You can, this is the green vent stack here. This is DMAP Sullivan Street and Duarte Square is the red pavers here. Um, and here's a photo of the DMAP Street where DEP's sewer easement lies here with the polka dots. <laughs> um, 
All right, so uh, we've gone to great lengths in design to ensure that we don't have any above ground elements on the DMAP street. Um, we will have some flush hatches and manholes, which you can see suggested in this rendering. We've worked closely with the Parks Department to adjust the grading of this uh, DMAP street so that when they undertake the redesign of Duarte Square, which is forthcoming, um, we're providing them essentially with a, a blank slate of sorts. Um, so this is a rendering. Uh, looking west on Canal Street. And these are the vent stacks that will replace the green one. Uh, these stacks connect underground to the mechanical and electrical spaces of the pump station. So there's no contact with sewage. There are not going to be any odor issues associated with these vents. Um, at DOT's request, we're also going to be extending the sidewalk um, across Sullivan Street to Duarte Square so that it's clear that this is a pedestrian space and no longer a roadway. We will have mountable curbs for emergency vehicles and also our own maintenance vehicles to get to our station for routine maintenance. Um, Mark asked me to speak a little bit about resiliency uh, for the project. <clears throat> so this pump station, like many of DEP's facilities, is located within the floodplain. So it has to be designed to our resiliency standards, essentially to keep this infrastructure running come hell or high water, right? Um, so typically when we are reconstructing pump stations, we will try to bring the electrical, equip the electrical equipment above, um, above the ground into a building. Um, we don't have the space to do that here, um, so instead we are using watertight doors and seals to protect the equipment uh, from water damage and we'll have some pumps as backups uh, to drain uh, the valves at the vaults uh, if we have any water infiltration. Uh, the chambers are also designed to withstand full submersion and the vent stacks, um, the height of them is, is basically ensures that they won't, that the openings at the top um, will not be subjected to flooding so the water can't we'll never get that high to come, come down into the station. Um, so we continue to work with our partners at DOT uh, on the traffic mitigation plan during construction. Um, we're still in the design phase here, so we will have more to come there, um, but we will have a period uh, during the final phase of construction uh, for roughly six months that we'll need to close the two westbound lanes on canal overnight. Um, to balance the traffic, the plan would be to turn one eastbound lane into a westbound lane, um, and we will always at all times maintain a clear five foot wide pedestrian walkway uh, around the construction. Um, we are also aware of the Port Authority's plan closures of the tunnel, um, and we're coordinating with DOT on that as well. Um, so just a little bit about schedule. Our next step is to take this project um, through the Public Design Commission uh, review process for approval. Their jurisdiction is limited to the work on Canal Street um, because their jurisdiction is uh, based on public ownership of property, so the public realm. Um, and then we anticipate beginning construction in 2024 um, with our active construction period scheduled for May 2024 to August 2026. Um, so that is my very quick summary of this project. Um, I'm happy to take your questions. And as I said, Matthew Osset um, and Umberto are also here. So Rich, you want to do the honors of calling on people? I know I want to talk, but let's yeah, want, people. Why don't you go them. ahead? Shirley, why don't you go first? You want me to go first? Okay. Uh, Alicia. A kind of just aesthetic question about the tall vent stacks. Has any thought been given to making them more attractive? I don't know exactly how that would be, whether it would be with some kind of design, uh, coloring. Uh, so, Shirley, you know. are asking the exact right person about that. <laughs> I spent a lot of time thinking about vent stacks. <laughs> oh, and the other part um, is it's not about containing it with some attractive enclosure. Yeah. So, so that, you, no, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that was it. Have you? Okay. Um, so these vent stacks, this design is actually taken from a prototypical vent stack design that we worked on with the Public Design Commission about 10 years ago. And those vents were designed uh, specific for some of our uh, water, water tunnel facilities um, coming through Manhattan. So this is actually an element that you do see um, on the streets of New York. Um, and so we're working 
to try to have some consistency with what is already out there in terms of like that sort of, I wouldn't call it quite street furniture, but that's kind of, you know, street elements, streetscape elements, right? Um, so these are, these these were very carefully uh, designed um, years ago with, with, um, with the design commission. Um, and they have a sort of uh, very, it's called a non-directional finish to them. Um, they are sort of a, a more matte, uh, metal finish, right, silver metal finish. Um, so our intention is really to create that that consistency. Okay, I actually have a couple of questions. Oh, so the so Sullivan area, I'm just trying to think, will that be designed as parkland or is that is that waiting until the um, real estate project is going to Wait, be done? Sorry, the, the Sullivan Street. Sullivan area. Street. Yeah. So my understanding, and I don't want to speak on behalf of the Parks Department or um, Trinity, um, but but when when the property uh, was acquired by Trinity, it came with a number of easements, one of which is the DEP sewer easement, which we're utilizing for this project, and another was a open space easement. And my understanding of this is that uh, Trinity was to work with the Parks Department on the redesign of Duarte Square. And we have had many conversations um, with both of those entities about what, about what might be forthcoming here. And we've done our best to give them kind of a very clean slate to work on when, when they begin their design process. Okay. And uh, it doesn't sound like it, but I'm just curious because we just, as you know, have seen the other project over on Hudson Street, but that was for the water tunnel and the pipes. And wondered uh, if this has any similarity in that way, uh, in terms of accessibility, I guess, to the land there and um, walking or moving. So once we're done with our construction on Sullivan Street, it will remain the demapped street, right? And the intention for that is that it is a pedestrian space um, and there would be unencumbered access from Duarte Square to the sidewalk in front of, um, you know, whatever ultimately is built on that Trinity site. Um, and, you know, so yes, my understanding is that that would be um, so it is different from the other project, in which you're you're referring to the Hudson Street site, avoiding many kinds of little openings and so forth, right? Right. Yeah. And so that's you know when we when we first started thinking about this project, I had those those shaft sites certainly uh, top of mind. It is much easier to try to you know to be thinking about all the future possibilities um, for a site than to to try to go back after construction and and try to figure out how to make that work. So that's definitely been top of mind for us. Okay, and um, so while the project is going on, will Duarte Square still be available for complete use? Yes, I'm gonna ask Matthew Osset to speak a little bit about that. Matthew, are you able to, to speak? We have been working with the yeah, Parks yeah, Department. Yeah, I'm, I am, I I am here. Can, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yep. Good, yeah. So um, we are going to use uh, a small, a uh, lane uh, along the sidewalk of Sullivan Street into Duarte Square for staging area. Um, the majority of its use, the longest period use will be just for a, a field office and some equipment storage. However, during the most active period of construction, when we, we have some heavy equipment on site, we'll need it actually for working area. So just, I, I don't wanna get too complicated or too, too detailed here, but we have to put in sheeting for the excavation and the equipment itself will pretty much be standing right on the sidewalk that that separates Sullivan Street, that's why I woke up, sorry, curb, that separates Sullivan Street from the park. So that period will have some more impacts, but other than that, they'll just be, just be the field offices on the northern part of Sullivan for, for the most of the course of construction. Okay. And um, you talked a little bit about the mitigations for traffic to the Holland Tunnel, I guess, on Canal Street. Um, would staging be going on on Canal Street at all? Um, In no other words, you said you closed two lanes, so I guess it will. Well, it's not, it's not actually staging, it's actually physical work. 
There's wow. some underground utilities and the existing station. But as Alicia said, though, that work will be for, I, I forgot exact duration, I think about three to five month period and any shutdown will only be at night. So it's three to five months and that's right. You did say only at night. Yeah, and again, as Alicia mentioned, uh, we're very interested in the in the Holland Tunnel shutdown because that might actually make things more efficient. We might be able to to instead of switching lanes in both directions, if no one's coming or no one's com no one's coming or going going to the tunnel, there may not be a need for for much traffic in the, in one direction. So that might make life easier. But again, that that we'll see how that goes because we both have time frames that are still right, and it probably would have to be observed and see see how it turns out there because. Yeah, peak traffic is supposed to be diverted away from that in the night, but we'll see. Exactly. exactly. Right. Okay. Exactly. And well. one last question, and this is really logistics. Um, we under and it's for Alicia really. Uh, we understand that you are planning to go to the design commission on March twentieth. We have a full board meeting on March twenty third, three days later. And so if we do have any kind of resolution on this, that would not be finalized until March 23rd. And wondered if that would affect your appointment with uh, PDC. So design commissions, it, we well, should be they fine. wait for our resolution. We should be fine, surely. Their submission deadline is like three to four weeks before they actually meet um, to vote. So you will have time to issue your resolution and forward it along to them. Okay. You can also send it to my attention and I can manage getting it to them. Right, yeah, it would be sent to your attention regardless. Okay, <laughs> great, thank you. Onward to Frederica. Yeah, Frederica's up. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, will your work be coordinated to be complete before any construction that, Duarte, that the Trinity people are have in mind? That's question number one. Question number two, is there any way in which when your work is complete, will you affect what Trinity's options, construction options are for the site? Okay, you've asked some very good questions and some very hard ones. Uh, let, let me start with the second part. We will not affect them, but they could affect us. Um, as I mentioned before with the question on the Duarte Square use, the same equipment has to put sheeting on the other side of the street as well. And depending on how advanced the Trinity project is, it may make coordination a little bit more difficult. So, for example, they're going to have a construction fence right close to that curb, if not on the curb. They may have uh, sidewalk sheds that block our access. Uh, we have met with them. We haven't met with them in a few months. They've kind of discontinued our, our, our biweekly meetings. But we 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 think we can work together. But it will it definitely will be challenging if we're both working at the same time. But, but just to answer your question more directly, they have a much greater impact on us as, as do we on them. And, and your first question was with Trinity. Um, Trinity has given us some dates. Um, I don't know how firm their dates are, so I, I can't speak to the timing. Our, our project is fairly well advanced in the in the in the design and procurement phases. And that early 2024 data is looking pretty solid. If Trinity can, um, if Trinity gets their their project moving faster, they could be fairly advanced by that date. Um, however, though, the, the longer it waits for their project to go forward, you know, the better. The better, to be honest, the better it is for DP. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, um, I wasn't thinking so much about the staging as I was about hearing from Trinity that they couldn't build a school on the site because of the work that was done, or they couldn't build, build a park. That's what I yeah, meant by yeah, their we've, construction we've, options. Not yeah, we, We've coordinated with Trinity and, as well as the SCA slash DOE. Um, we wouldn't have any impact on their construction. In terms of the park though, we, we've spoken to the parks department and we, have, we don't have a formal agreement, but if we did impact Trinity's ability to upgrade the park, the DEP has told parks we, we would take care of that for them. And whatever plans they develop, we would incorporate in our project. So at the end of our project, if we were still there and Trinity had finished the rest of the park, we would we would take care of the areas that we were impacting. Okay, but it does that seems to me to require a lot of communication between the two parties. Uh, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. I, I talk to the parks department probably three to five times a month on, on multiple projects. So we, we're on the same page. I, the trouble is I can't I kiss I just can't speak for Trinity. I just don't know their schedule. Sure. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. 
Anybody else? I don't see any others, sir. Um, okay. And again, just can you just go up? Oh, there, there it is. Anticipated schedules up. Uh, so yeah, let me yeah. just let me just give everyone an update of where we are because this this presentation is is always a moving target. Um, the, the first step of procurement is something we call BLA Bureau of Legal Affairs Review. We're going to finish that up probably early next week. Then it goes to City Legal for a one month review period. So that puts us in um, mid April. So we would advertise a job out for bid for contractors in 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 May and June. And then typically we start construction, official paperwork construction in November of 2023. And then Alicia's date of May 2024 is when we think people will actually mobilize and start physical work. So that would mean there is an overlap with the project across the street. Um, the, what, the, the MTA project, right? Yeah. yeah. The MTA project or the Trinity project? The MTA project. Yeah, I think that project was uh, was a September twenty twenty five. Six. Okay. Oh, okay. No, I can't remember. <laughs> it's it's, not, it's, it's a project will yeah, go on until twenty twenty six. They think they'll reopen the park uh, in the September twenty twenty four. Um, but the the other uh, question, I guess, is the state. Is, you're going to be. We heard earlier in the meeting, I think, before you came, uh, Matthew, about the. Um, the use of Duarte Square as a staging area for the work being done by the MTA. And, and yeah. since you guys are actually using Sullivan as, as a place you have to get into, uh, will you be using uh, the Duarte Square as staging as well? Is that? We're using the, I, I don't know exact dimension. I'm, I'm going to say about 15 to 20 feet from the curb west, east, I'm sorry, east toward the MTA site in that direction into, into the Duarte Square for, again, for construction work and then for a field office no uh, that that's what so into duarte square from sullivan street west east but correct kind thank of, you uh, kind yeah, of the, uh, this strip right okay, yeah, yeah. so not really in the square but in the uh in duarte park there yeah okay i'm sorry that's what i i when i when i heard duarte i assumed you meant the park but yeah. yes no, no, alicia no. alicia's picture is exactly right. the location no, the the issue is that uh, that we heard about earlier from um, uh, from one of the attendees was that is that the uh, the square is being used um, uh, for staging and their trucks going back and forth. Gotcha. Yeah, I, Trinity, I, you know, Trinity I site. You mean, Rich? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't go to the, I don't go to this area because there's no active work right now. But that that was news to me. It it really shouldn't impact us. We had no expectation of ever going onto that property except for that the construction activities for the foundation. Uh, I just saw that Janine had written on oh. the uh, chat that the school construction uh, authority information says that the school project is supposed to begin in 2025. So it's kind of all very tight, isn't it? Yeah, yeah after but tight, yeah. Yeah, very tight. Yeah. And, you know, Matthew alluded to biweekly meetings that we were having um, with parks and the development team. SCA was also um, at the table for those meetings. So and we have a, a very good relationship uh, with them and have a good understanding of, of the sequencing of their work as well. Um, the one thing that I do want to note is that we, you know, we have been engaging with M with the MTA and they have reviewed our plans for our pump station project. Um, but I, I'm going to follow up with Mark after the meeting to see if he can put us in touch with the folks who were presenting earlier, because I only caught the tail end of that. And I feel like having having that presentation might be sort of helpful uh, for us. Well, for them too, I bet. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and just one thing, I, I, it's not, just, just, a, just a general comment. I, I, I go to a lot of community board meetings lately, and I, I always get a lot of comments back about noise and dust and, and pollution. And, and it's really, I just want to let you know, it's extremely important to me. It's extremely important for our project teams to be good neighbors. Uh, we will always be available for you if there's ever a problem during construction. Um, I'm not the official contact because I'm not in the public outreach group, but it'll come to me. So if there's, and we'll, we can also establish, you know, individuals for general questions and comments, but we will have a full-time team out there to make sure that the contractor follows all the requirements for dust control, for noise control, uh, proper street closure. So, you know, I'm sure you've worked with DP before. We're not we're not going to walk away from this job, no matter no matter whatever your, whatever comments you may have. Okay. Oh, I see that uh, Carter. 
Carter, yeah. Yeah. Hey guys, yeah, I I had raised this question at our, one of our executive committee meetings uh, a couple of months ago, but you know we have so many different concurrent projects going on here. You know, how does one put together a group so that those conversations happen in advance, not you know when somebody pulls the truck up about what's going on. Um, and the, these, there seems to be a crescendo of, of, you know, a year at least where everything's happening. Um, and that's a huge impact for us and our community because the traffic impacts are, you know, are unknown. I mean, that's the magnitude um, disruption during the evening rush hour in particular. Um, so how, how do we go about having that set up? Who would manage it? Who would lead it? Um, I don't know if there are other projects that you've worked on where that's been the case. Um, and, and how can that information be disseminated to whomever it is, you know, is interested or trying to understand what's happening in, in, in the community? Carter, was that a question for me? Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, you, you, you're, you guys are the ones who <laughs> yeah. engage um, with with these projects. I'm not sure if you've had an experience, or you know, who who do we turn to to be the lead on that? Yeah, absolutely. I, that's a that's a wonderful question. I mean, I think you know, I've worked on projects all over the city, um, and you know, in very dense, you know, urban neighborhoods like this, there's a lot of infrastructure of all kinds. Um, a lot of it is aging. Um, this is certainly a very complex uh, site, but we have been working with our city agency partners um, for years uh, on this. And sometimes, you know, the MTA project a little bit took me a little bit by surprise <laughs> earlier. Um, but I think that you know we we have had engagement with the with the MTA, and it's I think having the having a community board is a, is a true asset for the agencies as well because you know you are the point where everyone is going to be coming and and speaking and so this was actually incredibly helpful um and we also you know the city agencies do look to the community boards as as for your feedback but also for all of the information that you hold yeah just as a follow-up it's generally um the companies involved most often this is private development for mm -hmm. us who where, where you have overlapping projects so they generally retain or hire somebody or a firm to do this but in this particular case it seems like the projects are happening prior to trinity putting a shovel in the ground so to speak i mean this project has been known since at least 2004 i think right which is the first probably before that because that's when the first easements were were done so it's it, it's we're, we, I'm not sure the community board is the capacity to do that on an ongoing basis and that's why I raised that um it, be, because we don't have the staffing and you know is that something that those conversations could start and maybe that's Trinity is the point person they are you know after all building a skyscraper there that you know that they are using now as a staging lot that they seem to be leasing or allowing you know the use for the mta and then you guys are doing this project to happen before they build their building or you know obviously a lot of that work has to happen before they're doing stuff so who do we turn to who who who's going to do this who's going to reach out um just to start that so, like I said, we were having biweekly meetings um, with with all of those uh, players, and I think we are due to have a check in um, with Trinity um, and Taconic Development as well. So we'll follow up with them. I'm sorry to interrupt. But isn't there an organization, or there was one in 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 the city departments that that coordinated projects between departments. I remember we interacted with them. They they sort of managed the work at Washington Square Park when they were doing the sidewalks and the water main. There was an organization I'd have to look up in notes that whose specific reason for being was to manage uh, projects across different departments. It was 
There well, used to be a new department of the public realm, I wonder. And there's so, cer role. certainly we're very excited about, about that new role. Um, you know, there used to be the mayor's office of capital project development. Um have to look. And so I mean, that might be what you're thinking of, Rich, but let Maybe. me know. Yeah, I will. I'll, I'll find it. Um, I'm sorry, Carter. I, I, I'm not sure. I, yeah, I, made yeah I just I just wanted to make sure that was a priority and something that we include in everything or just separately have a separate request for engagement. And, you know, and perhaps that's in coordination. Yeah, in coordination, um, just because these are such long term projects that that the staging and the the, the complicated dance of moving everything around their lane closures, you know, how that's going to be done um because it you know it's already difficult enough and uh this this just adds an element that can just impacts the residential community not not the avenues because that's where traffic backs up and that's why i raise it um in that in, in that way so thank you okay well rich i think we're ready to go to business session right You hear me, Rich? I think you're muted. Yeah, I, I, you're right. Uh -oh. I don't see any other. Uh, I don't see any anything. Um, Pete, uh, Pete, is your hand up again, or are you? Uh, uh, yeah, it is. I was just hoping uh, the committee or somewhere we could get clarification about ownership control of demapped Sullivan Street. Um, my understanding is that. The ownership of that was not fully granted to Trinity. That part of it is retained in public ownership. Um, so clarification on that point moving forward would um, be of interest. Thank you. OK. Do people hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Good. Okay, so Shin, first of all, thank you, DEP, for your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Lisa and team. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks yeah. for and I think we'll we'll have to move into business session now. Yes, please. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Rich, so Rich you want to say... conduct the business session? No, I, I um, I, as we said, uh, people are allowed to uh, to listen and. Um, uh, Shirley, what's your take on the uh, uh, resolutions? I uh, I think uh, DEP yeah. one. Well, you know, this last discussion almost feels like we need to do a joint resolution to MTA, New York City Transit, and DEP, just about that, those issues of yeah, and the, uh, yeah. Um, how do people feel about that? Anybody? I, I, yeah, I, I agree. I think we need to document our, you know, the the concerns raised or the requests made for, you know, who we interact with and management of these intertwined uh, projects. Uh, I and 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 the traffic ramifications and the missing, you know, all those things. I, I think we need to put that down. And and as someone mentioned earlier on throughout this, I'm not sure the day it's over, but the Holland Tunnel, uh, shut, you know, is blocked at night as well. So. Right. Yeah, well, the whole caboodle. <laughs> I mean, yeah, in a way, it also might include Port Authority. I, I don't know. Port Authority, you know, is having the, the tunnel closed, the northern, the northern section, I think. Uh, but I mean, it, just if we could just go to uh, the, the folks who presented and just with a request for them to go to these other agencies, I guess. Anybody else have some thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just, I, I, it, it just strikes me that, I mean, I know they're, they're meeting. I know they're meeting, uh, but uh, it just seems that, um, so I guess it's it's not true that it was accidental that they're unaware of this, but it, it would seem until we have this meeting that there just may have been uh, just a, a lack of awareness of these these uh, different projects going That's on. That's what seems to have come through, doesn't it? Well, I mean, the, Frederica <laughs> has a comment. So, Frederica. Uh, thank you, Shirley. I, I I agree that we need. I think we. I I, just, I came into the meeting thinking that we didn't need a. We weren't going to need a resolution, right. and, and now I think we do. 
And I think it has to include two aspects. One is confirming the things that we heard tonight about the timetable and you know other details. And the other is requesting certain things happen. So I hope that makes sense. I, I hear you. I know what you mean. Yeah, well, requesting like the coordination with other yeah. agencies. But also, like, like for example, we heard, you know, that the that the courts are only going to be offline for two years, even though the project's going to take four years. And um, so we just have to put that out there and and have, you know, mentioned that we we heard that and we're in favor of that. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the... I, I think that is a um, what are you seeing that in a resolution or in 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 just in the notes, Frederica? I I think it's I I think people pay more attention to a resolution, and I think you can you can figure out how to well, multitask in there. Like to to has a a hand of, up. Hold on, uh, yeah, put your hand up, Lois, if you want to talk. Uh, no, Jeffrey has a hand up. Who? <laughs> Oh, Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Yeah. Oh, oh Jeffrey. Jeffrey. But this is I think there's a few people left over from the stuff. from the public session. Yeah, didn't get uh, I think we have to move on. Frederica, yeah. would you like to suggest a few phrases, like a few whereas and resolves in, in that realm? Well, I'm you happy to have do a that offline. Online, right? Offline, but yeah, I offline, right. Yeah, sure. Yeah, send me a rich. Yeah, okay. thanks. So that, that would be a good thought because you may have some thoughts that it aren't really being talked in, in detail here. So that would be, Rico will send, whereas and be it resolved. Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay, um, anything else in terms of canal courts? I see George first, George? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes. The question, uh, it's, it's really a, a bigger issue than just the, that particular project, it's the, the treatment of the Holland Tunnel closing and timing and how it's being done. Uh, uh, I, I, I think we do need to have, perhaps it's a separate working group or study group to, to really review what's, what's about to happen to us. Because some of this is uh, it, not been discussed in any particularly large form and particularly in, in terms of, are there options? Are there different ways you could do this? So I'd, I'd be delighted to, to help with if we formed a, a study group just to see what the Port Authority is planning to do. They're not really known for being very open about what they plan to do sometimes. And maybe yeah, but it's, the, it's their responsibility to now coordinate themselves and let us know. We're really not equipped to do study groups. Well, and what do you think, are, Rich? Do they have a study group? I don't know. No, they don't. That's what we're suggesting to them to get some kind of. I mean, Rich, from yeah. my point of view, you can't really. We don't do study groups that oh, way. I, I don't think so. That's something uh, I've ever done. But that we're asking the agencies to please coordinate and report to us. That would but be what we're aiming at, right? Well, and to participate in some way, not just to get, be handed a solution at the end of the of the chain, but is there a productive way to offer up uh, uh, alternative ideas? Um, anybody have any thoughts? Uh, how, Dan, you had had your hand raised. Oh, Carter. Yeah, Carter, you want to give yeah, us? Thanks, Shirley. Yeah, I, the, the issue is to get everybody to work together so that there's not a, right. a confluence of too much activity at once. And there's enough lead time at this point that that's probably possible and and you run out of space to use for projects because there's so little here and particularly with doing work in such tight areas and and that's my concern and that's why having everybody talking now could over the next few years have a huge you know make a, a big big difference you know, with the with the planning and then people are aware things might be a little bit slow or moving faster, but there's not enough the closing off lanes here too much is is huge impact, you know, so we want to keep it just fluid it, it is, you know, as little as possible. But just tonight, it's obvious nobody 
has been to the site, talked about it, you know, you know, the, the, you know, just how, you know, a little change here could, could have a monster impact. So I, that I'm just trying to get everybody to regularly work together, have this mapped out. It's not, right. a, and it's so, not about not doing anything. Yeah. And Trinity so have, may be the lead project because they're the ones who will have the biggest impact when there's shovels in the ground and you can't use the spot. And I think they already, you know, have retained the services of, some of the um, lobbying agencies, you know, helping them with this. And that may be where that's done, but, you know, I don't want to solve this problem for everybody, but that's, they need to discuss it amongst themselves and and come back to us to explain to us how they're all yeah, communicating. So that leads again to what we said in the first place was to have a resolution about that. And to possibly also add some of the uh, recommendations that Frederica was making to put into and to ask them to come back, mm -hmm. to come back with a plan. Yeah, I think that's probably best. And I suppose it's, it's DEP, it's Trinity, it's uh, MTA New York City Transit, um, DOT, I suppose too, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think though that it's Port Authority. Port Authority has been working on that Holland Tunnel project for for several years. And um, this is just another phase of it, that they're, they're not going to so suddenly not have the tunnel closed at night. Uh, so it would be more a matter, I get, well, we could put them in. I mean, what do you think? I'm, I'm trying to get some feedback on it because maybe they can comment on, on how they think it should go in terms of where they're trying to divert traffic from that tunnel. Yeah, if I may, uh, Shirley, uh, yeah, I agree with Carter. Um, I, I, I don't think there's a plan exactly about traffic and they have to repeatedly come back to us because you can't just talk about a lane closure here and a lane closure there. And maybe, or I think we'll be in sync with the tunnel closure that's all being taken out of consideration. It's kind of like a little bit whitewashed, right? There's no details in it. So why don't we find out exactly what time they're talking about closing and how it's in sync with the closure of the Holland Tunnel and what days they're planning to do and when it's going to be open and what it's going to look like, because we didn't really see any illustrations. Of the Holland Tunnel? Actually, I think they do. No, talk Canal about Street. Things. They talk, They really talked about taking off one lane and then adding another, but what time of day? I mean, to me, it's like, you know, I went down Canal Street last night in a, in a vehicle and we cruised, right? Uh, because, and it was before the Holland Tunnel closed. It was actually working quite well, um, but there was quite a bit of traffic on it. What happens when they close from three lanes down to two, right? Because they're gonna take up one and they're gonna take up some sidewalk. What what time was it, Shirley, that they were gonna close? They were gonna close it and shift traffic? It's gonna be permanent, right? Or was it clear? Well, I think they said nighttime. Yeah, nighttime. Night and they I did give the hours. They gave the hours, but I offhand oh. can't tell you. I think it might have been 11 p.m. Actually, so all right. So the tunnel morning. closes at, at opening midnight. at six in the morning. Right. It might have been anyway. 11 or 11:30, but it, that was about that time, and then it was opening around six, I think, or maybe five. It was that kind of okay. Uh, so yeah, we could also send this to Port Authority. Uh, I do believe that being in sync is important. Like you said, Port Authority is not going to change its work schedule, but making sure it's in sync uh, and seeing that sync to me is reassuring. Really Does anybody else have anything else to say? Well, it, the Port Authority runs not only the Holland Tunnel, but it runs the path system where it is parallel to it. Uh, they've been talking about congestion pricing and other things. Isn't this the time to say what changes to on the path would uh, help to reduce the congestion of the roadway system? Are they totally independent? Are they, you know, are they two different worlds? Uh, it seemed to me you could say, let's offer a, a drastically reduced price on the path during the hours in which the tunnel is going to cause this backup that someone that is going to go all the way up to 14th Street. Uh, is that true? I mean, is that going to be that big of a backup? Uh, are there measures like may, perhaps making the path free between those same hours? Well, we had said that already, George, in our last resolution to the Port Authority, 
we had stated all those things. Okay, so we didn't. Did with the closing of the tunnel. And, and they certainly are supporting having the pass system available, but they did not want to make it free. But they had assured us that they would be having the pass available. Okay, I guess I missed that, sorry. Right. Uh, anybody else on this subject? So, no, just to, so we're saying two resolutions, one uh, that documents what we heard about the the courts, uh, the project under the courts, and then another uh, to document the, the the points around the uh, pump station, right? I think that's, I think that's- You mean what... two resolutions, just one to MTA. Right. Uh, and one to DEP rather. No, one to MTA, I'm getting mixed right. up. MTA. Two projects. Yep. MTA and just about the, the things that Fred Rico was speaking, was speaking of. Yeah, that that Frederico was talking about documenting what it was that was pledged, or you know, around the right. schedule and the value. Yeah. Okay, so would Frederico give language on that, mm -hmm. and then um, the other one would be a kind of a across the board to everybody reso. So, in other words, the DOT, MTA, New York City Transit, DEP, and do we want to also send something to Trinity? or leave it up to the agencies to do that. I don't I don't see a downside to include Trinity. In I think that. that's a great idea. Okay. So then the other reso is to Trinity. And the other reso is to one, two, three, four. And oh, Dan, you had said you thought Port Authority should be included as well, right? I thought it was a good idea because they're being mentioned. And it could make the project easier is one of the things that DEP said that could work in their favor. Yeah, good point. Or they or they could step on the max badly if they didn't work in their favor. Yeah. Oh, right. And they would have to observe it. Okay. Anyhow, those are the ones we're going to send it to. Um, second was it to all agencies. Way coordination. I mean, that's basically what it's going to say, right? It's just yeah. uh, simply that these projects are all going on at the same time. Uh, there are definite uh, overlaps, and they need to coordinate their times, their operations, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then right. come back to us, and that's about it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, even even if they. Um... They they just, they plan it out and schedule it so that they don't overlap. Overruns from the one will will end up uh, causing um, the conflicts. Okay, so let's move on to the four different accessibility projects. And um, can somebody tell me what they'd like to see out of that? I mean, obvious. Hi. Yeah. Oh, hi Shirley. Um, I'm happy yeah. to start if that's okay. Yeah. Oh, go right ahead. Um, so I would propose that um, that we write a letter, um, maybe coming from the entire community board, which I'm happy to draft, that would ask the MTA to consider including one of the bus routes that runs through CB2 when expanding the open stroller bus pilot. Um, my my one concern, I'm happy to draft it and happy to to pitch it to to the full board. And um, I was just chatting with Janine about this. Um, my one concern, though, is if the announcement for the rest of the um, the bus routes comes before the end of March. So I'm happy to message the MTA and just get a sense of timing if, you know, we have some time to put together a formal letter or, you know, if they are planning to make an announcement sooner, maybe there's there's quicker action we should take. Um, but for the open bus stroller pilot, that would be a recommendation and, of course, can in and include a resolution that that speaks to that. Yeah, so that, that is the... Uh... The stroller, the stroller, yes. Time, right? Yeah. Yes. Right. Uh, Lois. Yes, and uh, Natasha, in your letter, or 
for our group. What do you have recommendations of which bus route should go first? Or bus routes should go first? Because I think Sixth Avenue going up and uh, Fifth Avenue going down, but that's just my opinion. Oh well, yeah, so that's another thing. I mean, if we have the time, we could probably put out a survey and you know ask people in the community. But Natasha, is your feeling that they will be moving ahead on this that quickly? Uh, last month, I mean, just in the press, they had they had put out that they plan to move uh, move forward with the next phase of the pilot, quote unquote, soon. You know, I don't know if that means in a week. I don't know if that means, you know, in government time, two months. Right. Um, I'm happy to kind of get a feel um, from my contacts there just to, to get a sense of timing. Um, you know, we could, if we had a couple of weeks, you know, we could also look to see which bus routes are most heavily traveled. Maybe we prioritize those. Um, I know Janine had also made a recommendation similar to Lois um, about prioritizing north-south routes, uh, just because that's where a lot of folks, you know, get on and off with their kids before and after uh, school. Um, yep. Obviously, you know, SBS right. on 14th yep. Street is an incredibly popular line as well and, and covers a number of different community boards. So um, I think maybe as a first step, I can get a sense of timing and then uh, we can sort of take it from there via email. At the very, very minimum, I'm happy to put together language on a resolution. Um, again, if we have time in the next couple of weeks, I'm happy to do a more formal letter. Right, and Sixth Avenue has the library, Jefferson Market Library, that is highly used by carriages and so on. And um, what did Janine, did she give a specific route other than north and south? She did, she did. She had it, um, but we only had one route. I think it was like 32, was that it? In Manhattan, otherwise they were in other boroughs. And it was very yes. easy. Uh, my question is this, would we, should we, we're, we're going to be having our full board meeting on, on the 23rd. Today is the first. Um, mm -hmm. Week before the 23rd, the calendar will be sent out. We could, within the calendar, ask people for suggestions. Or do you think that's opening a can of worms? Please to the community respond. or the full board? you know to the, committees? to the community where the calendar goes uh -huh. to everybody okay well what do you think anybody have any feeling about that do you agree disagree and then you tally it up i'm not i don't know if maybe we would want to like have like I, a full full-on vote in terms broad? of yeah i don't know i think maybe keeping it um keeping it somewhat broad again maybe there's language where we, we could just be a little creative where we prioritize highly used lines or, you know, lines that, you know, cross over, you know, different um, community zones. Like I don't know if we would want to put that, that just might take too much time, but, you know, doing, you know, exactly which line and, and uh, serving folks. But, you know, I leave it up to you guys to what you'd prefer. Well, I'd like to get people's input on it. Um... We, often we do go to the whole community to get the very few people that will respond yeah. anyhow. So I'm I'm not sure. I'd, I'd like to offer. Janet, do you feel? Um, I'm not keeping track of the the timing here, but is there any harm in soliciting feedback? I mean, do we have time? We put out a notice and we see, you know, what people happen to to say. Well, it would be, as I say, um, within a couple of weeks, we put out the notice and we would do it through the calendar, the community board calendar. So uh, the meeting is the 23rd, so it would probably go out about the 16th, um, which is only in a couple of weeks. The question is, is, are they moving ahead that far? Is it a possibility for you to find that out, Natasha? Yeah, I could get a sense. Um, you know, they might say they they don't want to tell me, but I don't think there's any harm in, in asking. And I, I have some contacts in the press office too, just to see if there's a scheduled public announcement. Um, and then we, you know, we can take it from there via email. Yeah, well, then I think I, I would go along with Janet. I feel there's no harm in asking for people's input. It's a, it's a simple input. It's not even a questionnaire. It's simply yeah. 
do you, which lines do you think would most benefit from this project? Simple as that. And people send yeah. in their preferences. It always happens that very few do anyhow. Yeah. So at least That's we've true. done our due diligence. It's funny. <laughs> okay. And, and how about um, the class action settlement? You know, are there certain things that struck anybody that did want to ask about it? I mean, my concern, of course, is the number of years it's going to take, but I think that's all been kind of almost written in stone. That is not going to change. And um, my other my, my other worry, as I brought up at the meeting, was is that our little neighborhood, because we do have so many smaller stations might be really short change for a long time, but I don't know how you do a resolution on that. Whereas will be short change. I mean, does anybody have any feeling about that? Or should we just do a summary? Where's Rich? Rich, you there? Oh, you know, actually that's not his committee. Yeah, it's not mine. I was gonna say, <laughs> not, a, not a parks. Not yours, right? But still, if you have thoughts, anybody on TNT feelings about that? Surely. Oh, Michael Levine is raising his hand, and so is George Hycalis. Yes, very quickly, I just want to reiterate my major concern, which I raised and they addressed, is to make sure that there is appropriate maintenance written into the contract so that these elevators don't break down, and if they do, they are immediately repaired. I think we need to say something about maintenance of the elevators. Good point. Yeah, very good point. And actually, good point. I don't think it is built into the contract. So um, I think we need, we need to reiterate that. Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree with you, Michael. Um, Adam. No, I was just going to say it, it. It sounded like the way that it was built into the contract is over a 20 year, like performance based, integrated, uh, you know, repair and procurement design. So I, I think that's probably, you know, the best thing that we could possibly ask for is to have the you know original equipment manufacturer installer uh, also charged with the maintenance. So you know agree that we can maybe like pat them on the back for that, but I don't know that it needs to read like, you know, please do this. It's more like, you know, thanks for already doing this. Okay, it's a really uh, simple kind of thing. I mean, we all have the complaints if we have used ele their elevators. The elevators are usually dirty. They're also, they often have very odd smells. I mean, these are the kind of complaints we get all the time. I mean, it's an automatic whereas. Um, and then is it, would there be anything else? I think that's that to me is, is one of the major concerns. It's okay, you got these elevators and now will you maintain them too? And signage is an issue. I don't know if it will be better with the new elevators, but I've known I've been with a bike and I have to find an elevator and it takes me 20 minutes to find the damn elevator. <laughs> so I don't know if these new elevators will be more easier to actually find. You know, and I'm thinking that they did say they were doing new signage. So how does everybody feel? Should we ask for it anyhow? Natasha, oh, George, George is for us. George. Well, I'm, I'm about two issues maybe behind, but I'm looking for a bus route uh, for the pilot, uh, and the front boarding uh, doors or walking the length of the thing to find a place to put park your uh, Roy. Or, uh, why not pick the M14 bus since we're going to have a major investment, but it's going to take a long time for making the uh, six cents. Uh, Avenue, Seventh Avenue, subway wheelchair accessible. Maybe this yeah. could be. Started. And I think that's actually what somebody said. I think Natasha may have mentioned 14th Street, right? I do. Natasha? So, yes, the, it's already the... on, our, on our radar. Okay, thanks, George. Now, somebody else just raised their hand and they unraised. Um, who was it? I was just going to just add to Janet, um, if we, you know, including in a resolution about, you know, ADA station renovations, just, you know, could simply say to prioritize, you know, wayfinding. Um, 
just to sort of have a well, yeah, that's a good way of saying it prioritize what you find them okay so that's that's as far as um the contract right this is this is the uh class action okay so a very simple thing about what the, the situation is and that we would like to see a maintenance intention built in, blah, 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 and also um, wayfinding. And it's very important, especially if we're talking about accessibility. So we'll leave it at that. Just a short resolution. Okay, everybody agree? Okay. Yes, it's late. We had a lot on our agenda. So yeah. um, the 14th Street elevator, I think we talked about that in our resolution in July. Adam, are you there? And I think Adam wrote that resolution, as a matter of fact. And we were very concerned about the uh, stops on several, you know, different, different elevators for different floors. Exactly. So I, I guess we... Don't want to don't need to convey it again. We've said it once, so. Well, it sounds like they they took that to heart and they're designing mm -hmm. things more efficiently moving forward, which is awesome. Okay, so moving forward, they are. They're uh, they're changing the elevators. So that might be just a little summary, huh? I don't think we would require any other resolution on that. Everybody? Yes? No? Sounds Maybe. good. No Sounds good. good. Okay. <laughs> and the last is the on-demand e-hail. And I will tell you that I just wish they could increase the numbers. In other words, they're still sticking more or less with their 1200 they started with 200 and then they gradually increased to 1200 but there was some talk of going to 2400 and i don't know why they decided not to but i i my, i myself feel that maybe that's a good thing to be pestering them about do, do we know anything about this like the usage of the program wait times like before we say we need 2400 how often are the current 1200 used i mean maybe they need I to gather they are used from what i in the articles i've sent you take a look I, they say that they're used all the time and that there's a great demand do you have any in person on that Natasha? I don't just from the articles that that you had mentioned that just in the past year or so, you know, the the quality of service from the pilots has not been as great as when it first started. Yeah, and and that I mean, I don't know how, how many hundreds of thousands of people that are uh, disabled or challenged in some way or just, you know, lugging baggage or strollers or whatever. There's thousands and thousands and thousands and this might benefit them to some degree. So as far as numbers, I think, yeah, there, there would be a big demand. I guess the question also is, is the balance with the regular vans? And if the regular vans gave better service, then would it be a necessity to have as much of this other kind of more tailored service, I guess you could say. All right. One would think they could work with Avia or any of these new tech companies that have all sorts of, you know, routing, you know, efficiencies <laughs> to improve their even their existing assessor ride. It, it's a little disappointing that. <laughs> yeah, it's a little disappointing that the only way they could address it was in this particular pilot and not to actually improve Assessoride. Well, it's a we're bad. actually going to be having a whole session on Accessoride. Oh, Valerie. 
Yeah, um, I think the, uh, thank you. Uh, I think that uh, the Committee of Public Safety for the City Council held a hearing maybe two weeks ago uh, where okay. it was specifically about accessoride. Um, right. And the inefficiencies with the program, from what I understand from a friend who uses it, um, uh, the not the eHail program, but the regular Accessoride. Right. They got a lot of feedback, so I'm sure that recording is on Legistar uh, somewhere uh, that has that feedback or written feedback that might be helpful um, for the committee to look at. Um, as right, well. and that's just Accessoride, and we actually that's are Accessoride just mm -hmm. on Accessoride which Natasha's gonna be involved in actually, right, Natasha? And um, at, that, at that time, I think we should be looking into that. But as far as just this, this, this uh, e-hail type program, we, what's the general feeling? Just raise your hands if you're interested, if you do wanna do a resolution. Okay, then we won't. So we'll just do a summary. Carl, Carl wants to do a resolution. Carl, do you want to speak? Or are you just raising a hand in favor of resolution? No, I do. I feel like it's been forever that like parents, handicapped, anyone with like any mobility issues, they're just supposed to, you know, the reality is they just pay out of pocket. You call an Uber, you do whatever. There's not, and that's only a certain part of society. So I don't know what people do because it's like, it's absurd. You really cannot actually get onto the public transportation system with any reliability and get from point A to point B today. And that's crazy. So I, I, you know, I feel like this is really overdue. And it's not just for like families or people with strollers. It's with, I, I really have no idea whether people are homebound or just don't get to experience most of New York City or anything because it's just not actually maybe there's a you know they're even saying right now like the the map shows accessibility well it showed accessibility but it doesn't actually show you when it was updated or if it was updated for today or yesterday or a month ago okay, and they so were on the what we're talking about that sounds more like accessoride right no so, i think like other uh, entire system so it's not right, just right. um so i think it's you know it's great that unfortunately they lost the, you know, the suit, which took 12 years, but like, they're not, they're really doing the minimal. And so, you know, the actual need is humongous. Like anybody that has a child and wants to push the child in a stroller and not have to carry and just, you know, it's just, it's absurd. So I just don't really understand why we wouldn't push harder to have better accessibility that is real time available for and safe and clean. Yeah, okay, ja Janet just said we should have a separate session. We actually are having a separate session okay, great. on Accessoride. So maybe well, that's I, where I, we no, deal I with it. I don't think Accessoride is gonna cover it though because it's really the subways and everything else. Accessoride is very specific for people that have like chronic conditions. Okay, but right now while we're dealing with this Accessoride, Carl, if you want to suggest something to put on the agenda, then do, and we'll deal I with do. it. I do, I think okay. for the- oh, Then tell me later, not now. Okay. Oh, you're late. Okay, all right. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, so, okay, agreed. We're gonna deal with all of it, both the regular accessoride by van and the accessoride by e -hail and whatever other kinds of variations in accessoride we will deal with, okay, in our accessoride session. Okay, so maybe we'll just write up a little review of what was said about this e -hail. Just a little paragraph. Yeah. Or two. Okay, paragraph on e -hail. Okay, I think we're done with MTA New York City Transit. So Rich, do you want to address no. any more about the EP? Or are we no. just gonna stick with the resolution that says, Guys, get together and coordinate and come back to us and tell us what you're going to do, right? Yeah, that I think so. Resolution. Yeah, I, 
I think at this point, that's that's all it is. I, as to whether or not they want to redesign the vents, or I, that's I, I don't think that's uh, worth um, discussing uh, now in a resolution. I think it's the, the the that would just dilute it. I think it's the concern about um, choreographing the the different projects and all the different challenges that are going to go into that. Okay. Anybody else have anything to say? Have we covered everything? <laughs> Yeah. Amazing. Do we yeah. want to go to sleep? <laughs> yes. Do we want to <laughs> not yet? Not yet. Did you, okay. did you say well, do we want to go to sleep? <laughs> yes. I, did. I mean it's been it's been a long evening. But yeah. anyway, okay, I think we, we've kind of figured out what we'll address and what we won't address. And um, mm -hmm. you know, we'll we'll get it to everybody and uh We'll see what everybody says in response. Right? Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, you. Really thank, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you for your patience. Good night, everyone. Take care. Okay.